You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a bit better put on a rope. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it in a chip with a key. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 13th part of What If Deku Helps His Best Friend, Peter Parker. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. When Momo exited the limo in Corasanto Ward, she still couldn't believe the sight before her eyes as she gazed up at the structure. Smack dab in the middle of Tokyo in its most prolific ward outside of Shinjuku was a castle that would look more at home in the Edo period than in a modern city filled with skyscrapers. The black-haired beauty collected her belongings, wheeling them behind her as she made her way towards the entrance, which was a gate with walls surrounding the castle. She had to stifle a laugh at the sight of a Starbucks right next door to it and a donut store across from that. She took a deep breath, calming herself as she reached the front gate. Her black pearl-like eyes spotted a camera on the side and she turned, giving a light bow. Yeyorazu Momo I presume, asked a voice as a slot slid open in the door, and someone was gazing down from within. Yes, I am. I am here for my internship, she stated, bowing lightly again. The slot closed, and the sliding gate opened, revealing a bald man wearing a security suit. We have been expecting you. He smiled, bowing in return. Please follow me yeyorazu san I am Nijimatsuna. It is a pleasure to meet you. The honor is mine. She said as she pulled her bags behind her, the security man walking towards the great castle. The courtyard had gardens possessing intricate bonsai trees with swaths of pebbles modeled perfectly around them to simulate the sea, with some even featuring koi fish ponds. My compliments to your architect. Your agency looks remarkable. Momo said with a smile. Thank you for your words. Masha has a saying that clothes make the pros, and that can carry over onto the clothes of one's home or business. Nijima said with a nod as they got to the front door, which slid open like an electronic glass door. Momo took note of that saying. Then again, Yoroi Masha was around during All Might's debut. Once they got inside, it was not like the interior of a castle. Rather it looked like an office, with people at desks, cubicles, and computers, and some sidekicks talking amongst themselves. Momo could even smell fresh donuts. Of course, we're not as labyrinthine as an Edo period castle, Nijima said, obviously catching her surprise with a slight smile. Naturally, Momo mused as they crossed a wooden bridge that curved over the expanse of desks and cubicles. She looked around, taking note of the hollow exterior that took up about three to four floors. Around the edges she could see various old-fashioned doors, with some people walking to and fro. Of course, it is similar to an old castle at the topmost floors, where Mushasan has his office, meditation room, guest rooms, and his own personal dojo as well, along with some specialized rooms. Nijima guided her to the elevator. He is on the top floor. You'll find him there waiting for you. He stepped back and bowed. We are honored to have a fine UA. Student as yourself intern with the Yoroi Musha firm, Yeyorazu-san. Momo blushed and bowed in return as she pressed the button for the top floor. Thank you for your kind words, Nijima-san, and thank you for your help. The bald man offered a light grin and stepped back, just doing my job. The elevator doors closed and Momo had the elevator to herself as it rose up. She was going to be working and learning under a top 10 hero. She unleashed a big grin, letting out a laugh at the thought. Who would have thought she would have gotten to this point after everything in UA? All those lessons and training had paid off, and her performance at the sports festival had been impressive as she looked down at her hands. Her mother's harsh words resounded in her head as she narrowed her eyes. I'm a person, not furniture. She muttered to herself as she clenched her hands. Momo shook her head. She was about to meet Yoroi Masha. Calm down. Focus. The elevator stopped, and the door opened, revealing an authentic Japanese hallway with wood walls, floors, and various tables with minor decor such as vases with sakura flowers, miniature bonsai trees, clay figurines, and a signed baseball. The busty teen walked up to the door at the end of the hall, reaching a hand for Come in, said an old gravely voice, and the girl perked up. She slid the door open eagerly. Within was the office of Yorai Masha, the equip hero. Various suits of samurai and shogun armor were lined up on the left and right sides of the room, with sunlight pouring in from a glass roof up high. Before her, sitting at a desk was a broad and tall man donned in traditional white and red trim robes, with a set of samurai armor and a kabuto-esque helmet that featured a horn in the center hanging on a frame next to the wall. 
His eyes were dark, comparable to someone like Ishido, and his great white beard reached to his upper abdomen as he sat straight yet unflinchingly. His mane of white hair hung past his shoulders. Yeyorazu san Welcome to my agency. Momo perked up, licking her lips as she bowed once again. It is an honor to be here and working under you, Yoroi Musha-san. She replied, doing her best to keep her voice calm. He exuded such authority and power. She looked to her sides, seeing that her suitcases were still with her. Oh, um, if I may, I wouldn't want to bring my luggage into your office, Musha-san. Your guest room is to your left. You can deposit your belongings there before we talk about your training. In your room you'll find your training Hayori. Musha rose up before he walked around his desk, and Momo realized he might be as tall as Shoji. Training Hayori. Yes, we are going to begin your training. So once you settle your belongings, change into the Hayori and footwear we have provided, and meet me in the dojo opposite of your room. Musha growled as Momo stepped out of the way, allowing the samurai to walk on through. Bathroom is connected to your guest bedroom with a shower and bath attached. He got to the door, opening it without giving her a second glance. I'll be waiting. When you enter here, he reached for a wooden carved figurine, and in a flash, it formed into a sword handle akin to a katana, minus the actual blade. We will begin and I will teach you how to improve your quirk and cover your weaknesses. Momo perked up. She saw the old man turn around, and she could see his cheekbones rise with a smile. I watch in record television you know. The girl turned, seeing a phrase posted above her door as well. It was in hiragana and carved into a wood board, followed by the English words ask. Akusoku Kiyomru, purge evil immediately, she asked, and the man looked back at her. Yes, the initials, ask, is the password, he added. Momo blinked. To what? The Wi-Fi. Momo blinked again, and Musha chuckled lightly. I'm old, not dead. Now go on. He nodded. Get dressed. All right, Momo blurted out, looking around as she got her suitcases inside. She was wasting one of the top ten's time. Mustn't keep him waiting. She spotted her white and dark blue Hayori complete with shin-high socks and Japanese-style sandals. It was time to begin her training. Izuku was nervous. Now, this wasn't an entirely new feeling for him. He was nervous all the time really. Elevators made him nervous. Clowns terrified him. Even the neighbor's far too large dog made him a little antsy when walking down the sidewalk. But he felt relatively safe in stating that standing on the sidewalk in front of the pro hero Ed Shots agency that the cold sweat he was breaking into now was a cut above his typical skittishness. The agency looked like a normal building, albeit with Japanese highlights like the rooftops and such. The train ride wasn't long from Musutafu to Kashiki Ward thankfully. Sure he had the attention of and was the successor to All Might himself but somehow this felt. More, like he'd really earned it. That all the hard work and all the tears and all the pain and everything up to this point had amounted to something real, something tangible. That someone else, not just All Might, had seen his worth. The fifth highest ranked hero in the country no less. And he'd been the only one in his class to get an invitation from Ed Shot. That was absolutely amazing. At least that's what he felt before his own self-doubt started gnawing at his insides, sucking dry what little confidence he had. Because clearly, this was a mistake. What interest would Edshot have in him? Parker was the one who fought most like Edshot so surely the hero had meant his sole invitation to be sent to his classmate, and just got it mixed up. He was the kid that broke his bones whenever he flicked his finger too hard. Edshot was not only an extremely powerful hero but a master of ninja arts and the door doesn't bite, someone said in a soft voice behind him. I know, I'm just G.A.H. His frightened scream could have awoken the dead. Whirling around he saw Ed Shot, steaming cup of either tea or coffee in hand who merely tilted his head, the crinkle of his visible eye showing a bemused amusement. He had Ed Shot Sam, Midoriya, welcome to my agency. The masked hero smiled, nodding before gesturing inside. Shall we? I'm sure you're eager to get started. W wait so. It wasn't a mistake. You really want me to intern with you? The shinobi hero offered an appraising eye before slowly nodding. Of course, come now, there is much we'll have to cover in this internship if my suspicions are correct. The man started to move and it took a second or so for Izuku's feet to remember how to walk after him, his suitcases rolling behind him. Suspicions? About what? Wait, don't tell me. On the workings of your quirk of course, its usage is what we're here to refine and train after all. That's a relief. He doesn't know about him and all might. Ah but he stepped into the building, which he realized now was more akin to a dojo, at least on the first floor. I well if I may ask sir, why'd you pick me? The number five hero reached the other end of the dojo, removing a jacket and a pair of gloves as he answered. Frankly, when I look at you, I see potential. Your quirk can clearly throw out a great deal of raw power, but you simply don't know how to refine that power without injuring yourself. 
you lack either restraint or precision, and I'm guessing it's the latter, given your fight during the festival. Izuku opened his mouth and then clicked it shut. That was pretty accurate actually, but he hesitated again. He looked down, fiddling with his fingers. Why just me? You didn't offer your internship place to anyone else. Why not Todoroki, or Bakugo, or Parker San? They're all just as good if not better. Edshot finished removing the excess clothing and finally turned to look at him. They are, the shinobi hero admitted, and Izuku winced. Then again, he is right. Parker and Kaken did round out the top two at the festival. If I cared about such I'd have offered them my time easily. But I don't care for the power or the speed of a quirk. Many heroes have power and speed. Even the refinement of fighting technique and strategic skill is something valued that many heroes have. You demonstrated a bit of all four but that doesn't matter. Training can do much Midoriya, but it's the will that separates the great heroes from the common ones. Headshot stepped closer, staring him down with a placid calmness that made him all the more nervous but somehow helped. I saw everything in that fight you had against Todoroki Shoto, Midoriya-san. He said pointedly, his cheekbones rising to form a soft smile. Your body was breaking. You had every reason to finish your fight with the Son of Endeavor quickly yet you didn't. You could have won so much sooner, yet you didn't. You had the courage to walk down a road few would have traveled. You tried to help your enemy, to save your classmate from a self-destructive road, even at great personal risk to yourself. Izuku glanced up, his eyes wide. But how do you, Shinobi? The man smiled again. Espionage is a specialty of mine. With that specialty comes perks. His one eye closed in an amused curve. Like lip reading, the green-haired boy's jaw dropped as he let out a gasp of awe. Why you were able to read our entire conversation even in that crazy battle I that's amazing. As expected of a top 10 hero. Incredible. Cameras playing on loop also helped. His eye closed in clear amusement as Midoriya's amazement deflated somewhat. And recording it at home. Oh well, oh. T that makes sense. That's why I sent my offer to you. Of all your classmates I can see that you are the one who is closest to the ideal of a true hero. Like All Might, not Peter Parker, who the media covets, but you. Izuku felt his heart soar as he perked up, grinning widely as he felt his eyes water. I'd like to help you reach that ideal. Now, would you like to get started? Izuku felt tears gather in his eyes even as he tried to swallow them down and not thoroughly embarrass himself on his first day. Oh of course. All right. Edshot nodded and clapped his hands. Izuku felt a gust of wind and looked behind him, and his suitcases were gone. My psychics will place your belongings in your room, which is on the top floor with your name attached to a sign. For now, we are going to begin our first exercise. He turned around, gesturing for the boy to follow. Izuku did so, smile beaming bright. I get to train under Ed's shot. What sort of training method will he teach me? Will it involve fighting giant robotic dummy villains? Or perhaps learning how to meld into the shadows? Izuku thought as he followed him through the agency, stopping at the last half of the dojo. We're going to see just how well you handle yourself before we move to the streets. They arrived in a garage of sorts, and before Izuku was the single biggest obstacle course that the boy had ever seen, well, outside of UA. The garage was well illuminated, and it was bigger than even his own house. The green-haired boy could see two of the hero's sidekicks sprinting through a set of climbing rings. Someone jumped off a ledge to grab the edge of another platform with nothing but their fingertips. Some even contorted their body to move with a set of rotating pillars as they dodged and swerved to the other side. Izuku remained silent, mouth still locked in a closed-mouth grin. Whoa, for now, I'll be looking at what you can do with my own eyes. Edshot gestured to a dark green t-shirt and basketball shorts as he tilted his head. Eye curved as his cheekbones rose up, smiling. I'm expecting much from you, Midoriya-san. Izuku beamed bright before he wiped his eyes and smacked his cheeks. Giving a confident and determined smile, he nodded. Right? What? Peter spoke out as he looked up at the massive building that was the address to the agency of one Yuzujiyama Rumi, the rabbit hero Mirko. The front looked like a normal small office of sorts, but right behind it was a friggin' football stadium. It looked bigger than MetLife Field. This is the right place. Karen spoke in his ear. I guess so. Peter mused. At least the view around Endo Ward was beautiful. He could make out Mount Fuji far to the west, and there was plenty of lush forestry and greenery around the ward. It definitely had a laid-back kind of feel, without the urban sprawl of Musutafu or Inner Tokyo. Well, he took a deep breath, walking up to the door with his suitcases and opened it, walking into what appeared to be a front office. All around him were various plaques in addition to framed newspaper and magazine covers, all with the titular Mirko herself on them. 
There was a fancy all-glass desk with a computer and a head poked out behind it. One with auburn hair and raccoon ears. Hello? Peter asked, waving meekly. The woman behind the desk beamed as she hopped out of her chair, and the very very short woman trotted up to him. Ah, uh, you must be Peter Parker Sam. A pleasure to meet you, she stated as she walked up, bowing respectably. Peter quickly bowed deeply in turn. Goodness she was only up to his waist in height she was so tiny. Was she as tall as Nezu? She looked human, but had the ears of a raccoon, and the tail of one too. What was it that Japanese called them? Tanuki, Tanuki, my name is Nakiri Shizun. I am Mirko Sen's personal secretary, and assistant here at the Mirko firm. A secretary, huh? Well, it's nice to meet you too Nakiri-san. Peter rose back up, and offered his hand to the diminutive woman who shook it. Is um, Mirko San around? He inquired as he looked around the office. He could see a long hallway behind Nakiri, presumably leading to that giant stadium. Oh, she should be doing her light training exercises. She's been on that ever since returning from her usual cross-county patrols. Nakiri replied as she spotted Peter's bags. Would you like me to take your bags? We have your room set up and everything. Oh no it's fine, I can carry him myself. Peter smiled as he lugged his suitcases behind him. I think setting my stuff down before seeing Mirko-san would be more, um, appropriate. In stuff, he added with a shrug as the Tanuki girl nodded. Alrighty, just follow me Parker-san. Nakiri gestured with her tail wagging affectionately before she led the way down the hall. Peter followed, walking past some rooms. He could make out the signs on the doors, labeled as bathroom, kitchen and laundry as he walked past. Did heroes normally live at their offices? He knew that you spent a lot of time there, but she had the time to return home and actually have a bed outside of work. It wasn't like she was a workaholic. Mirko must be the same then. So, does Mirko sleep here often? Peter asked as they got to a room as Nakiri opened it, and the American noticed the label on the door titled Design Studio. Okay, both me and Mirko Sandu, although when she's out patrolling she tends to go cross-country. Nakiri opened the door wide enough for Peter to enter and Peter's eyebrow quirked up. When she's back here, she tends to either train or work on her hobby, that being interior design but. She paused, smiling awkwardly and for good reason. Usually the bed would be as far away from the door as possible, but it was super close to the door. The desk was in the middle of the room instead of against the wall and the nightstand was on the far side of the room instead of right beside the bed. She's a very avid learner, albeit stubborn and with ooh. Room to improve, Nakiri stated with a grin, and Peter could only laugh and smile awkwardly back in turn. He had no room to operate in here. Okay then, I can, um, work with this. I appreciate Marco Sanji going out of her way for me here. Peter set his bags in the corner and made a mental note to shift around the furniture of the room. His ears perked up at the sound of a clanging noise, as did the very noticeable ears on Miss Nakiri. Ah, Mirko-san should be finishing up a set. Nakiri opened the door for him, and the taller boy walked towards the sound of the noise. He opened the door and his eyes widened. Before him was a massive gym set underground like a basement, at least in terms of square feet, and all around the area were various pieces of weight-lifting equipment with giant massive steel blocks, very much akin to the quirk gym he worked out at during his beginning days here in Japan. The bars had a number with a lowercase t attached and Peter recognized what that indicated. One ton blocks, all the way up to 20 tons. Peter gawked in English. His quirk gym only got up to 7 metric tons. The sound of the clanging was louder than ever as he winced. Feeling a tap he looked down and saw the tanuki secretary handing him a pair of earmuffs. Thanks. Peter put them on and walked down the stairs with Nakiri and he saw the source. Right under the stairs was a leg curling machine with two four-ton steel slabs the size of SUVs being lifted up and down by the machinery. The powerful bronze muscular legs lifting them were attached to a white-haired girl. Red eyes focused as sweat gleamed all over her while she focused. She let out a gasp and let down the machine which fell with a clang, making the ground shake lightly. Yeah, definitely needed the earmuffs. The woman stood up from the machine, dressed in a very tight-fitting sports bra which showed off her six-pack abs. Said bra was very clingy to her modestly big chest as Peter's eyes began to roam downward towards those mighty thick muscular thighs, which were clad in basketball shorts. And in place of normal human feet were those of a white rabbit. White rabbit ears emerged from the sides of her head and poked straight up, covered by some unique kind of sock as she took a deep breath. Done, she muttered before she took off the sock-like cloth around her ears as they twitched. She turned, her ruby-red eyes looking back at Peter. She then smirked, showing a cocky and confident grin as she stepped down from the weight-lifting machine, and Peter realized as he looked down at her. 
She was short, but, man was she hot. So, this is Peter Parker. The bronze-skinned woman drawled as she walked around the American as Peter took off his earmuffs, sizing him up. Hello there, Mirko san He bowed deep. And yes, I am Peter Parr. He recoiled and stepped back, avoiding a finger flick as Peter looked at her oddly. Excuse me. He asked in English. What was that for? Don't bow too deep like that. She pointed at Peter as she held a hand out, and Nikiri trotted past her, grabbing a towel and handing it to the taller white-haired woman who spoke in Japanese. I get that Bowen is important, you being American and all and you trying to fit in. But if you bow too deep you're practically brown nos in the other person. Give yourself some respect. You're not some salaryman. You're a hero in train and she had began to wipe her face as she began to squat down, then rose back up in a manner of stretching. So if you're gonna bow, do it modestly. I ain't gonna be teaching a kiss ass. Oh, ooh. Peter bowed again. Not as a deep 90 degree angle he has done prior all the time, but at a 45 degree one. Like this, the rabbit hero rolled her eyes as she peeked over her cloth. Dot 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 will work on it, Mirko said behind her towel. Nakiri, he settled in. His belongings are in his room. She chirped as the bronze beauty walked over and bent down, her bunny tail wagging as Peter's eyes rose up. Attached to a big tight butt. He bit his lip, gulped, and looked away. Good, the bathroom has a bath and shower. We even bought some extra towels and clothes for you. They're the white ones, yellow are mine, pink are Nakiri's. We clear. Marco ran down as she finished drinking before she began to stretch her arms. Um, yeah, sure. Peter nodded. She was being very blunt as she turned around. Her red eyes narrowed at him. When we're done with our first session, Nakiri's gonna give you a company credit card. You can use that to buy whatever food you want. There's a mall a block away as well as some food stores and a grocer. Or did you not notice like most kids these days who are attached to their phones like fucking facehuggers? Mirko mused as she walked past Peter, heading towards a weightlifting machine. This time some sort of assist squat machine. There was even a robot spotter with clamps too. I saw them, yes. Peter would have sighed but he perked up. She'd heard of aliens too. So, what's gonna be our first session? Or are we going on a patrol? She stopped, and the rabbit hero turned, displaying a dangerous smirk. Oh, so eager ain't ya? She grinned before turning around, hands on her hips. Let me get this clear to ya, Parker. I'm not doing this for some charity, taking you in under my wing. But when I do something, I make sure to give it a hundred percent effort. She then pointed at the taller boy. You'll be a better hero, Peter Parker. Know this, when I'm done with you in these next few days, I'll have you begging for mercy. Peter gulped, his hands going to his collared shirt as he began to unbutton. The bronze-skinned woman quirked an eyebrow. What are you doing? Don't I need to get undressed? Um, I have workout clothes in my suitcase. Peter gestured up the stairs. Are we gonna work together here? Spar? Here? Mirko gestured, before she scoffed and smirked. Ah, that stuff comes later. I know you're super strong and all that. But for now, we need to get to the brass tacks of things that'll help you improve by leaps and bounds. She walked past the weightlifting machine, opening up a fridge, reaching in and pulling out a carrot stick. Peter snorted, covering his mouth. This is too obvious. Nikiri just smiled, hands folded in front of her. W what brass tacks? He asked, doing his best to contain his mirth. Izzy. She pointed a carrot at Peter. We're watching films. Oh, oh. Peter's excitement turned to confusion. Like, alien? You mentioned alien earlier with the face huggers and stuff. Mirko quirked an eyebrow. Not those movies. She sighed, rolling her eyes. For fuck's sake you really need to improve on your Japanese. She muttered under her breath as she looked to Nakiri. Hey, Nakiri, help a girl out. Right away Mirko-san. Nakiri chirped as she pulled out her phone, typing it in. We will be watching a tape. She spoke in heavily accented English. Tape? Tape of what? Peter asked as he heard a nibbling and a quick munching noise, turning around and seeing Mirko nibbling down the carrot rapidly. Don't laugh again, she may notice this time. Oh god why was she so hot before now she's adorable stop stop stop. Peter bit his lower lip to prevent the snorting. The sports festival. Peter felt his blood turn cold at that memory, wincing. Mirko finished her carrot, tossing the green stem behind her into the trash can. She smirked, licking her lips. Familiarize yourself with the machines here that we will be working on eventually. I'm gonna take a shower. She grabbed her towel and walked past her. Vekiri, give Parker whatever he needs. I'll be out in ten. She leapt up over the two onto the balcony and walked back into the agency. Peter turned down towards the Tanuki woman. Um, um I know Mirko doesn't take psychics or do team-ups. Is she always like that? You'll warm up to her. She's being very nice to you to start. 
That was nice. Okay then. Peter buttoned up his top buttons on his shirt. I'm gonna go familiarize myself with the place. Will you need anything else, Parker Sam? Nakiri asked. I think I'm good. Thank you again, Nakiri Sam. Peter smiled, bowing lightly as the Tanuki girl giggled as she went up the stairs. The American took a deep breath, looking over the weight machines. He only ever got up to around two tons or so back at that gym. Mirko was far beyond that, and that was only her legs. Her legs though, talk about never skipping leg day. He muttered to himself in English as he began to walk around the gym, inspecting the familiar machinery and their weights. For a hero that can leap over buildings in a single bound effortlessly, Karen spoke in his ear. I can say that I am not surprised. Can't the Hulk do that and better? And Thor, Peter mused as he walked around, inspecting the weights. Ten tons. Jeez. He stretched his arms. I think I'm gonna be looking like the Hulk when I'm done with her. Both Hulk and Thor have never been officially measured for their maximum capacity. Karen explained. But judging by what Mirko said about the film of the sports festival, she must be evaluating your performance as a whole. Peter looked down at his hand. The same hand that had torn concrete and was one symbol of peace away from. I guess so. He muttered under his breath. He pocketed his hands and turned around, leaving the gym to get his belongings sorted in his room. 1. Step back to guard. 2. Step back to guard. 3. Every cycle made her arms burn, but she didn't even think about stopping. Her mentor, the equip hero Yorai Musha sat cross-legged at the edge of the dojo, clad in his samurai kabuto armor for whatever reason. Momo didn't know if the older gentleman was asleep or simply watching everything under the shadow of his helmet. She assumed the latter, so she didn't stop swinging the hollow katana sword handle, not until she couldn't feel the grip of her quirk anymore. That was the real challenge. Every time that she swung, her mentor wanted her to fill the space with a real blade, smaller than even a tanto or wakizashi, more akin to a dagger if anything. Small to start out, faster and simpler. Since the start of her training, the inner workings of the sword had grown by a few millimeters as her speed improved. That was the true test, to make something the length of the Bakken and the time that it took her to swing the training sword down. It seemed simple at first, but then the speed at which Musha forced her to go out threw all her calculations out of the window. Normally, she had time. She had some sort of estimation of what she was working with in order to make something. But with each swing, that window got faster, then slower, then faster again when Musha commented that she needed to speed up. And so she kept moving, kept swinging till she got to the diameter that she was currently struggling against. Around her feet, the metal remains of her many, many failed attempts littered the ground. It was getting to the point where she would have to make a broom to take them out and avoid them from touching the bags of fast food that Mush's assistants bought for her to keep up her training. Enough for now, the old samurai said with a raised arm, restore yourself. Momo wanted to thank him, but her lungs screamed for air. She gently set the handle down, and on wobbling feet she took a seat next to him, grabbing an unwrapped burger on her way. You've improving, he commented, shaded eyes looking at the messy pile of blades that she'd created. It's not enough, she said as she tore into the triple cheeseburger, aiming to soothe her aching hunger. It will be, Musha assured her as he continued to sit. You started sloppy, but over time, you acquired a decent form. You adapt well. The Hayori wearing brunette scarfed down her burger before reaching down for some fries to eat. You told me this would be vital, creating a blade from the handle in the span of a swing. Yes, Musha mused as he reached to his side, picking up a clay cup filled with tea. That explained the aroma. You can create anything so long as you know its molecular structure, but such a process takes time. This training is to lessen that weakness. I can see your reasoning. She said, finishing with a handful of fried potatoes before going for another. But I do not see why I have to conjure while swinging a sword. I can see the physical and mental benefits from such training. But wouldn't something like a metronome be more efficient? She saw the taller and broader equip hero turn his head, his dark eyes looking down at her. The purpose for this is as simple as the art of kendo itself. The older man said as he began to sip his tea. It is repetition. Our quirks are like muscle fibers. The more we use them, the stronger they can become, so in a way, this training covers more than two facets. Momo looked to the side as she thought on his logic. So the sword swinging is for physical training, me creating up the blades inside the handle and increasing their length the mental. The swing itself is the timer, while the art of me using my quirk over and over again aims to help me paint a picture in my head faster. Musha nodded, and she could see his cheekbones rise up in a small smile underneath his great white beard. Correct? Ensure that your mind is clear of any and all distractions. When you swing down your handle, focus on the art, not even why you aim to become a hero. Musha replied, eyes hard as Momo went about finishing her fries and then sipping on a vanilla ice cream shake. 
or fighting for others, have your mind as clear as can be, and have it be filled in those moments only on the motion of your blade and the item you will create in that span. Momo dabbed at her lips with a napkin after finishing her drink, looking up at the wise old veteran as she nodded. To have her mind be clear of all distractions. That achievement may be tough. I'll try my best, sir, Momo assured, and the old hero nodded before he climbed to his feet, towering over her as he walked over to a table, carrying his cup of tea. He held the cup in his hands, and then in a flash, the cup was transformed into a kitchen timer, so that was transmute, the quirk of the fabled Yorai Musha. He turned it to the 60-minute mark and set it down. Continue your training for the next hour. Then, clean up this room and dispose of the blades in the workshop on the basement floor. They'll appreciate having scrap to work with, Musha said as he turned for the door. Afterwards, go to the mess hall on the first floor. My cooks will prepare for you a recovery shake. Rest for several hours, then I will return from my patrol. He turned his head towards her, and we will resume until dinner. Understood. Momo stood up straight, taking a respectful bow. Yes, H&M. The door slid shut and Momo grabbed her handle, looking down at it and taking a deep breath, to clear her mind of distractions and any thoughts. Yet how could she ignore why she became a hero? How she got here? Who she was aiming to help and fight for in the future? Her family? Her friends? After all, Musha-san was an incredible hero himself. A clear mind, Momo murmured to herself, pushing some of the blunt blades to the side of the room as she returned to the center. She got back into position, handle raised over her head. She would watch her sandal-covered feet when she conjured those blades. A clear mind. 1. Step back to guard. 2. Step back to guard. Yet the image of her mother's harsh glare, Peter at the festival watching the Pony vs. Bakugo fight, and his own final bout against the Ash Blonde were not so easy to remove from her mind. Izuku breathed as he leaped from post to post, yelping as he did his best to maintain balance. He continued jumping on top of each wooden log, the surface only about two feet in radius as they seemed to be getting smaller. He glowed, conjuring one for all as he made several more strides and leapt for the platform, hands outreached. He got to the top, seeing the buzzer at the end as he reached out. The timer went off, and the 30 seconds were up as Izuku reached the buzzer, but he only felt disappointment swell within him. All right, Edshot appeared beside Izuku, making the green-haired boy look up at the pro hero. You have agility and speed, but your precision and timing needs work. Sorry, Edshot Sam. Izuku panted as he got up. Third time and I couldn't make it. He winced, rubbing his arm that he had gotten a bruise on. This was his third attempt at the obstacle course the pro hero had set up. The first time he fell in the first 10 seconds. Second time he got to the ledge, but the third time was the same old story. He couldn't seem to keep his balance when going at 5% speed, or at any high speed. It's not something to sweat over, it's time we go over another facet of training. Perhaps this method can help you better understand precision. Edshot said as he folded himself into some string-like thing and swerved through the logs and out over the other side of the pit, shifting into his human form. He was fast, practically a blink of an eye and he covered over 30 meters. Izuku clambered to his feet and used the ladder to climb down from the platform. He trotted out of the training room and up the stairs towards the ground floor. He grabbed a spare towel to wipe the sweat from his face as he climbed up, still in the workout scrubs Ed Shot had given him. Returning to the dojo-esque environment, he smelled something. Rice? He mused. That definitely smelled like a rice cooker as he followed the scent, walking through the wooden halls as he came upon a room filled with tatami mats, and kneeling down by a table was the ninja hero himself, with a rice cooker beside him and two bowls on the table. To the other side of him was a small stove with a pan on it that contained sizzling fried eggs. We'll be having a little brunch, he said, his visible eye closed. I assume since you arrived early this morning you didn't eat much for breakfast. Well, I had some toast and a protein bar. Izuku mused as he walked inside, making sure to remove his shoes before he took his seat on a pillow, sitting across from the ninja hero. He had his hands in his lap, unsure of what to do. Being hungry will make you lose focus, Edshot stated as he raised a hand. His fingers contorted and folded in, becoming small sharp tendrils as they lifted up the pan and began to flip the eggs over without a spatula. Izuku stared in awe. Now then, Edshot turned, seeing the rice cooker beep as his other hand contorted into the same tendrils, courtesy of his quirk foldabody. The tendrils turned off the buttons, lifted the lid and began to use the spatula spoon to lift the helpings of white rice into the bowls. Izuku's eyes were wide as he saw the tendrils, all as thin as paper, lift the presumably heavier grains without edge shot so much as straining. 
Then the hand handling the eggs grabbed another spatula as he served the two fried eggs with their yolks undamaged onto the rice within the bowls. Wait, wouldn't it have been easier had he just used his hands? You're thinking of something, aren't you? Ed shot mused as his hands returned to normal. As he reached for the bowl, his hand exploded into folded tendrils that lifted the bowl up to chest level. His right hand, bowl less, morphed into more tendrils as he grabbed some chopsticks and got the sticks into position. Um, yes, you're using your quirk for cooking and eating. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just seems like a lot of effort for something so mundane. Izuku mused as he cupped his chin. Edshot let out a soft chuckle. Well, why don't you try it Midoriya? Izuku froze at Edshot's suggestion. After all, how else am I able to use my quirk so effectively? It's essentially a muscle of the body, so if I use it while doing normal tasks such as eating, it would result in it getting stronger and its usage being easy. Izuku beamed. I was going to say that it saved going to the store for extra chopsticks, Ed Shot said before he smiled, but the thought is sound. Of course, I always limited my power to the times I needed it, but I've never considered the idea of using it while doing simple things. Izuku smiled, looking down as he reached over. Okay, focus my power throughout. He glowed with red lines across his skin before green energy sparked out of him. And then, he reached for the chopsticks and grabbed the bowl filled with rice and egg. Thanks for the Izuku gripped the bowl and brought the chopsticks down into the rice. And the bowl cracked in his hands as the chopsticks snapped in the middle. Meal, rice and egg landed on the table as he bit his lip, looking down at the mess he'd made. He saw another bowl and a spatula placed before him, courtesy of Ed Shot's finger tendrils. He looked up, ready to apologize when he stopped, seeing Ed Shot smiling at him. How much power are you using right now, Izuku? All I, 5%. The shinobi nodded. Good. He reached behind him, sliding open a closet panel to reveal rows upon rows of bowls and chopsticks. Plucking out a set of each he held them out to Izuku. Let's go for seven. His smile got a little wider, planting the bowl and chopsticks on the table and sliding them closer. You can leave when you finish your serving. Izuku picked up the bowl, understanding the lesson now as he grasped the broken bowl, doing his best to keep the majority of the rice within before he deposited it in the new one. This is what you're gonna use to help me train my control. Yup, the hero chirped, unrepentant. If you don't break a chopstick, you won't break your bones. And every day I want you to do this while pushing past the maximum you feel safe using your quirk. And like any part of your body, strengthen with use. So, we'll be using it. The only time you're allowed to shut off your quirk is when you sleep. Carefully now, Izuku reached down into the bowl, not breaking it this time but snapping the chopsticks like dry twigs when he tightened his grip. He cringed, then a new set was in his hand as the old one was plucked away. He looked up to see Ed Shot sliding a tall jar full of the eating utensils to the middle of the table with an oh-so-pleased smile on his face. Careful now, I got them in bulk and at a discount, so they probably break easy. He was kidding, right? Peter sat in front of the biggest personal TV that he'd ever seen in his life. The massive screen stretched out till it started resembling a home theater screen. Though, considering who he was with, he really shouldn't be surprised that no expense was spared. She had an entire stadium as part of her agency after all. The viewing room as his mentor called it, was basically a personal theater but with only a single couch and a coffee table in front of it. Posters for drinks lined the armrests, and Peter was pretty sure the dial on the side was both a remote for the theater screen and the massage functions in the couch. All of this stuff, in a place that probably hadn't been used seriously for more than a month. Wow, being in the top 10 really did pay. It made him wonder how much All Might walked around with on a daily basis, only for his thoughts to leave him as a shiver ran down his back. His hand snapped out, catching something inches before it passed over his shoulder. A carrot. Ha, huh, what do you know? You do have eyes in the back of your head. Mirko hopped in, vaulting over the couch and sinking into the cushion. Peter squeezed up against his side on instinct, though it didn't look like she cared or saw him move with how she started attacking her own carrot. Thought I was seeing things when I was watching the tournament, but what do you know, I owe Ed shot 20 grand. And just like that Peter was sure that this woman didn't even have a concept of modesty in regards to money. And he remembered that 20,000 yen was something modest, being close to 250 American dollars. S sorry to make you lose money. Eh, it wasn't doing anything useful anyway. Mirko shrugged, chopping on her carrot and tapping the dial on her side of the couch. Instantly, the theater screen flashed to a view of a news report that looked more like a sports announcement for the Olympics. Of course, that's only what it looked like, there was no sound. Everyone saying the same thing. Mirko drawled, rolling her eyes as the video feed covered the students participating in the sports festival, with talking heads yammering on. 
These kids are going to be amazing. They're the next generation of the top 10. One of them will definitely surpass all might. You don't sound like you believe any of that. The bronze-skinned heroine turned over at him with a dismissive glance. Cause I don't, Mirko said as the news reports began to cover the USJ. Incident. Ouch. You kids got attacked once, handled yourselves pretty well from what I've heard, but you haven't gotten into the thick of it yet. She glanced his way, the edge of her eyes shining with a sharpness that sent a shiver down Peter's back as she smirked. The carefree confidence that all but exploded out of this woman made him feel like his namesake. But, I'll admit there are exceptions, she conceded, you've got a bit more experience than the average kid. That much is obvious but you've got a ways to go. Case in point. She gestured to the screen, where the war showed a picture of him swinging away from Bakugo. Does the phrase go for the gold mean something different in America? She asked. Cause I'm watching an American literally piss on his chances of victory. Did you take notes from Endeavor? He's turned being unable to get number one into an art form after all. Peter winced. That wasn't what he was doing. I was sure that my team could deal with Bakugo. And how'd that work out for you? Mirko asked with a lazy glance towards him. She clicked a button, and the video turned to the sight of everyone stuck together in the final melee. Everyone scrambling, yelling orders, Midoriya and Sato engaged against Todoroki. He and Momo fighting Bakugo while Kirwaro and Yuraraka were running through the building, desperate for the last flag before Shinso appeared to earn his team the last point that it needed to tie everything up. We won though, Peter pointed out. In a tiebreaker you almost lost. By the skin of your teeth, all your facial hair. Mirko stopped, frowning, whatever water is in that guy's tear ducts. Who is she? Oh, right, Midoriya. So, she said, resting her hands behind her head and crossing her legs. First question of this little internship. If this war started up again, and everything was the same, what would you change? Uh, Peter started, quickly racking his brain. What would he do? Well, if he had all of his gear like he did before, he'd probably do a little more to slow down Bakugo, or maybe left earlier to try and stop Todoroki from getting. He took a long breath, trying in vain not to let that particular memory cloud his thoughts. Mirko didn't even so much as twitch, happily closing her eyes and singing a song to herself while Peter thought, I guess I'd go after Todoroki sooner. Yeah, Mirko screamed, sounding like the world's smallest most toned buzzer as Peter jumped. Wrong. Peter didn't have a response to that. Wrong. What the hell was she talking about? Yes, she was a hero, but his opinion mattered, right? How is me being honest WR? Wrong again, Mirko declared, holding up a finger and making Peter flinch back in the same breath. But I didn't. Wrong. Another finger flew up. I. Wrong. She said with a wide grin. It was reminding him of Bakugo in some respects. The fact that they had similar eyes was not lost on him. Peter felt a burning headache swell up but he responded as calmly as he could. Is there anything that I can say that isn't wrong? Peter said. It wasn't wrong per se, you just took too long to come up with it. Peter blinked. He dot 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 what? He looked at her, confused. She smirked, rolling her eyes. Way back in the day, I had a teacher know what he said. The question was rhetorical as she put her hands behind her head. He would say, a smart guy making a late decision with hesitation will always lose to an idiot making a hasty decision with confidence. He blinked. He kinda got that. You had all the options available to you in the war kid. Every single one and instead of going for a clear objective and seeing it through you tried to do everything and did a whole lot of nothing. All you did was chase your teammates. So me helping my teammates is bad. Peter asked, eyebrows raised and tone sharp. Mirko sighed. You don't get it, do you? She tapped on the remote. Let's tally. She pressed a button and the playback immediately rewound to a shot of him chasing back Hugo. So, step one. Did you stop the guy you were chasing? He was stopped. Not by you. She sing-songed. So no contribution there. She slid her finger and a shot of him confronting Todoroki in the warehouse to help his trapped teammates appeared. You went to rescue your teammates. Were they rescued? He blinked. Of course they were. I stopped Todoroki from eliminating them. Were they able to contribute for the remainder of the war? His mouth opened and slowly closed as he saw her smirk widen. The clip of Asui carrying Shinso up the red tower with her tongue while Pony floated beside her confirmed her question. So no rescue. A slide and another image of him circling around the perimeter 50 yards away from Shizaki's vine barrier was featured. Siro's taped up section can be seen in the corner as Peter saw Heimolf taking off from there. So what did you do here? She asked. You left your teammates. You're not fighting anyone. Not scouting, not threatening enough for them to divert resources and forces to you that can swing the fight. 
I took down Ciro after this. Because that idiot chased you, not because you took the initiative. A clip of him fighting Kirishima. Tetsu Tetsu and Mina appeared as he subdued them. Same with the three stooges, none of which were worth any points of their own. She slid her finger. And Theon, another still image of the scrambling, desperate last fight. That Kyugo charging from high, Todoroki from low, with Yuraka and Kirwaro close behind them several buildings away. Your base is under attack and you're nowhere to be seen, and in no position to help. I arrived. He protested, gritting his teeth. After the party was halfway done, she countered with her giving him an eyeful. So what exactly did you contribute through this whole fight? It stung what little pride he had, but she had a point. He looked down, scowling at the floor as he bit into his carrot. A whole lot of nothing. He repeated her words. You're damn right. Her teeth crunched into a carrot. So what you need to learn, more than anything else, is to make a decision. Take your balls out of your purse and act on the decision. With confidence and speed. Think about it. If the second you got out of that king ring, caught back Hugo and then rushed with the full team behind you to get at Ida, and the rest of the blue team with Todoroki beyond the halfway point, what the hell woulda stopped you? Shizaki, maybe. But she woulda had a hard time stopping you. That Midoriya kid and the frog girl, along with that other kid that could go underground. And outside of her almost nobody else could work as a water break to stop you. Only Ida could have caught any of you but he's limited to the ground. All three of you had vertical mobility and it would have forced all the team's resources to double back to protect their base, rather than go after you guys whenever they wanted and at their own levels of preparedness and initiative. You didn't save the match, you almost brought down everyone because of your indecisiveness. She was blunt, but she had a point. Had he followed Mirko's scenario, he could have ended the war in. 2. 3 minutes tops. His shoulders slumped as he ran a hand over his face. See what I mean? She asked, Mirko smirking lightly. Yeah, I. I just wanted to help my friends and teammates. And you would have helped them by winning it a lot sooner. Then you wouldn't have had to carry so many leeches on your back. Peter turned his head, glaring as Mirko looked at the TV in disinterest. My friends weren't leeches. He growled. I didn't say all of them, I said many. Mirko turned her head back, eyes hard as she dared Peter to talk back. But we're not here to talk about them. You're the man of the hour. She leaned back, crossing her arms as she relaxed on her side of the couch. You're a smart kid, so answer this. Do you think All Might solves every problem in front of him? Peter nodded without hesitation. Mirko's response was immediate. Do you think he moves on to the next one without finishing what's in front of him? Peter rubbed his temple and slowly shook his head. You got a lot of things going for you kid, got to be blind and stupid not to see it, Mirko stated. But while the media, common sheep, and your friends are piling on the praise, the rest of us with experience see a kid that needs to figure out what to do when he's fighting. Another shiver and Peter's hand snapped up, catching the remains of Mirko's carrot. He looked down at it before seeing Mirko stretch her arms as the bronze-skinned woman relaxed in her seat. You react, instead of act. People need heroes that have the stones to act on what they think is right the second they think it. They just need to be saved. They don't need to overthink it, get me. Be proactive, not reactive. Mirko reached down by her side and pulled out another carrot. Peter nodded again, resisting the urge to shake his head at the answer for how simple it seemed. Why yeah, I get you. Now, moving on. You were focused during the race, not bullshitting at all on your way to victory. Good. During the war, well, we covered that. She looked back at him. During the tournament you were all over the place. You were a goof against the inventor girl. You pitied Sato. I wanted him to make a good impression okay. Peter snapped, fed up. You could have ended it with just a throw for a ring out or one blow. Imagine how Sato would feel, knowing that a friend of his, his deputy class rep, was looking down on him by toying with him. Mirko scoffed. I wouldn't call that a friend. I'd call that an arrogant elitist. So me not giving him any leeway to get a good chance at an internship to help in his hero career is bad then. Peter snarled. I'm saying that as a friend you should give it your all. Leave it all on the field. The white-haired woman responded. Anyone will respect you for doing that. Given it a hundred percent. Going plus ultra. You didn't give him help. You gave pity. The fact he doesn't see it means he was ignorant and stupid. On that basis alone. She turned, glaring at Peter. He's fucking pathetic. Peter gulped at her stare, taking a deep breath before he stared back, stealing himself. I don't regret it. He got offers. He'll do well. He would have had offers anyway. Now, we get to more positive shit. Mirko mused as she got up from her spot on the couch. Get dressed, we're going on a patrol. Peter turned back towards her, eyebrow quirked. Then he blinked. We're going out now. Tiroing. Mirko turned around, looking up at him. Course we are. 
You're strong and have some experience, so you don't need train and wheels. You brought your hero gear and costume right? She asked as she departed from the home theater, Peter following right behind her, a smile slowly growing on his features. Yeah, I did. He responded as they got to the main hallway and walked down it. Mirko looked back and smirked. Good, see you in ten. She got to her door and went inside. Peter bit his lip, grinning as he bounced on the balls of his feet before trotting into his room. He got to his suitcase, opening it and pulling out his mask, seeing it in his hands. Within minutes he was dressed up in his suit, placing his new mask on. The visor was clean and had a light blue tint as opposed to the clear view from before. I assume we are going on a patrol. Yeah, Karen? Peter asked as he sighed. We are. He looked down, and his HUD came to life, showing his vital signs, a circular GPS map, and fluid amounts in his cartridges built into the suit. He saw the virtual icons come to life over his fingers and the web shooters. Your web shooter combinations are available by audible command. Or would you like to make a gesture? Karen inquired. Peter bit his lip inside his mask. Let's stick with audible for now. English commands. Understood. We can go over the selections of webbing whenever you like. Peter smiled, nodding as he let out a content sigh. Got it. He perked up, hearing knocking on the door. He opened it and saw Mirko in her leotard, who was wearing a belt as well. She looked a bit taller, and he looked down, seeing her special rabbit boots. She had unique feet when he saw her in the gym. You ready? Heard you mumbling in English in there. Mirko mused, hands on her hips as Peter gathered himself and then he saw her ears twitch a little. Ah. Uh, he nodded, shrugging. Just, um, talking to myself. He patted his cheeks. You know, psyching myself up. He jogged in place, arms pumping. I mean, gonna be patrolling with the number 7 hero after all. Don't get too riled up. Just try to keep up, she grinned. We, Nakiri, will be back by sundown. Just going around the block. She yelled as she walked down the hall towards the front lobby, Peter following close behind. Wait, sundown. Understood Mirko-san. Have a good patrol. The Tanuki lady waved with a grin as Mirko gave a confident grin, opening the door as Peter waved back. Um, be back soon, he said as he walked outside. So, we gonna patrol Endo Ward. Endo, here, Mirko scoffed as she waved her arm towards the skyline. We're gonna circle all over Tokyo in a spiral. Outer wards, then make our way to Shinjuku. She grinned as she tapped the pavement under her with her feet. Peter's eyes widened under his mask. So, what's your hero name? You got the fancy costume and all. Is it Spider Mite or something? Nope. It's ooh. Peter stood up straight, feeling his heart begin to swell. Spider Man. He smiled, while Mirko blinked. Huh, plain. Eh, hey, no matter. She grinned dangerously as she tapped the floor again. Just try to keep up Spider Man. What's that saying in America? You're not in New York anymore. She spoke in accented English before taking off, dust and wind bursting out as she made a mighty leap, jumping over the nearby building. It's you're not in Kansas anymore. Peter yelled in English. The boy beamed, and he leapt up, jumping as high as he could as he followed the same motion, running on the rooftops. Up ahead, he could see Mirko jumping up and down. He aimed his web shooters at a nearby water tower and pulled, rocketing off as he twirled in midair, soaring. A roar of jubilation escaped his mouth as he flipped and fired another line of web, pulling himself towards a skyscraper as he twisted, arms out wide and legs curved. Mirko was ahead still, but he could see the giant array of high-rises and buildings before him, all the wards of Tokyo combined dwarfing anything New York City could muster, all those skyscrapers and real estate. Spider-Man smiled. Back Hugo Katsuki got off the bus, collecting his suitcases as he took in his surroundings. He rubbed his eyes, doing his best to stay awake. He had flown in from Tokyo to Nagasaki, leaving the house with Dad driving him at 3 in the morning, well before traffic and gridlock of the Tokyo morning rush hour. After picking up his boarding pass he was on the 5 o'clock flight. He had landed not even 30 minutes ago, ran through the mostly empty airport to the baggage claim, and then hopped onto the first bus available at the bus lane outside. He looked at his watch as he shivered from the ocean breeze. It was just before 8 o'clock. The blonde looked up at the building before him. It had the appearance of a typical office building, but the billboard of Gang Orca Agency was prominent as it hung overhead. Katsuki closed his eyes and turned, walking up to the entrance and carrying his luggage behind him as the blonde let out a sigh of relief. After a moment of contemplation, Katsuki opened the door. Hello? He asked, voice low as he poked his head inside. He was greeted to the sight of the walls being literal aquariums, filled with various marine life that Katsuki couldn't recognize. He didn't pay much attention to the animal channel. Ah, good morning, said a voice as an elderly woman leaned up behind her desk. She looked normal, with her graying hair done up in a bun, but she had one big eye where most people would have two. 
Her cyclopic eye was behind a monocle of sorts. How can I help you, young man? Katsuki reached into his pocket, grabbing the card Orca gave him the other day. I'm here for the internship. He presented it to the old lady, and she beamed. Ah, you must be Bekugo-kun. She sat back down and leaned over to her phone. Sakamoto-kun, you have a visitor. Coming, came a low voice on the other end as Katsuki licked his lips and took a deep breath. He felt uncertainty gnaw inside at his heart. Katsuki picked up movement behind one of the aquarium walls. The door opened, and out came the hulking and towering form of Sakamoto Kuga, the killer whale hero, Gang Orca. He strode in, his red eyes narrowed as he saw the blonde boy. You came after all. I did. Katsuki nodded, having a hard time looking into the whale man's big red eyes. Did you come in by train or plane? Plane. Three in the morning. Couldn't sleep really. Gang Orca let out a scoff but not a dismissive one. Those flights are the worst. Did you have any breakfast? Katsuki perked up as he looked at the man. Well, had a ham and cheese sandwich on the fly. Come, he gestured, turning around. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day after all. Orca growled as he turned and began walking away. Katsuki tilted his head, and the man paused as he looked back. Well, my stuff, he said, holding out his suitcase and bag. We can handle it. Came some voices as some men came striding in, all in dark diving suits and wearing masks of some kind. Katsuki reasoned that they were some of Gang Orca's psychics. We'll take your belongings to your room. You go eat, kiddo. Leave it to us. Katsuki stepped back as the rather shady-looking minion-esque psychics grabbed his luggage before dashing down the hall. Orca stood at the door, arms crossed and finger tapping his arm. The blonde took the hint and trotted up as Orca turned, both walking down the blue illuminated hallway. Shouldn't we cover anything for my internship first? Katsuki asked as Orca led the way. We'll go over what we will be covering this internship with you while you eat. Orca opened a door, allowing the teen to walk into the eating area. There were nice tables scattered about where some people in formal business attire and others dressed in dark diving suits ate while conversing amongst themselves. You gonna eat anything? Katsuki asked, looking up as the man shook his head. I already ate. Go on ahead, I'll wait for you, he said as he lumbered away, taking a seat at a nearby table. Hey a boss, said a sidekick as he waved. Oh hey, breaking in the new intern. Obviously, chirped a tall giraffe-like lady. Orca simply nodded in acknowledgement as he took his seat. Katsuki turned and walked towards the line and looked at the menu. Lots of seafood options. Then again, they were a healthier alternative to most meats. Katsuki settled for the salmon and cheese omelet with hash browns. Collecting some milk, he returned to Gang Orca's table and sat down with his tray. Good choice on the omelet. Now, Gang Orca opened his eyes as he sat there, eyes hard as his massive webbed hands rested on the table. I am glad you took the choice to come here on your own accord. Katsuki looked down at his plate, swallowing thickly before he moved to eat. After a moment, he spoke. Can I ask you a question? You may. How can? Oh, good morning Orca-san. A familiar voice cut in as Katsuki paused and looked to the side before his red eyes widened. Tsunotori Pony stood there, dressed in her orange bodysuit with various padding on her shoulders and knees. Her joyous expression remained still before she began to frown. Good morning Tsunotori. I was just about to bring your partner up to speed. Orca replied as Katsuki blinked. Partner? They spoke out at the same time. Katsuki in Japanese and Pony in English. Tsunotori was cut off when her big blue eyes widened at the sight of the ash blonde sitting in front of the killer whale hero. Katsuki understood why. Gang Orca was so big that she must not have seen him. What are you doing here? You never said anything about taking on another intern. Katsuki spoke sternly from where he sat. Orca scoffed with a roll of his red eyes. And where was it said that I couldn't take more than one? He snarked back. His eyes panned over the both of them. This will not be a problem. I am aware of how you two fought at the festival both during the race and during the finals. But that was then. This is now. Am I making myself perfectly clear? Orca's eyes narrowed. That Hugo bit down a curse and Pony visibly caught herself, straightening before her bunched shoulders relaxed. Do I need to repeat myself? Orca's voice could have cut through stone. No sir. Pony caved first. I got it. I'm glad we understand each other. After breakfast, we'll begin our patrols around town. Back you go. Once you are finished, you'll go to your room and change into your costume. The blonde looked from the American girl back to the whale man and nodded as he went about eating. Right? Midoriya Izuku, once a quirkless boy, and now secret successor to All Might, felt the sweat pouring down his face. In his hand, the source of all of his pain stared back at him. Its slick, uncracked surface was strong, but only for now. All it would take was a single flinch, and it would crack like the egg that it was. He took a deep breath and tossed the egg into the air. 
and in the corner of his eye, an edge shot straight for his face. He rolled forward, the green lightning of one for all giving him just enough speed to avoid the pinpoint kick. Izuku's eyes flashed over, but there was no one there. Wait, no, focus. His head snapped up and the egg fell towards the floor. Izuku jumped, throwing out his hand, and catching the egg just before it hit the ground. Yes, he screamed. Then his fist closed on reflex, and the yolk splattered out of his hand. Izuku's smile twitched before he buried his face into the ground. Oh don't worry, Ed Shot said. The younger hero could imagine the half-smile on his face. I've got more eggs, he said, holding up another dozen. That sentiment didn't help much. Around him, the shattered remains of the last dozen attempts at keeping his control stared back at him. The original idea was simple. Keep fine control, even in the heat of battle. Today's breakfast hadn't gone well, so Ed Shot gave him some protein bars to snack on instead. Hundreds of chopsticks filled up the trash can. So Izuku was supposed to throw the egg, catch it, and throw it up again without breaking while Ed Shot took a few pot shots at him. As you'd expect of a top 10 hero, all it would take was one attack, and Izuku would botch it. Actually, a few of these splattered eggs resulted when Ed Shot simply needed to hit his hand. Strikes that Izuku couldn't even see coming, and it was only a fraction of what the hero could do. Izuku remembered reading on his wiki that Ed Shot could attack at the speed of sound and beyond through only the refinement of his quirk alone. What he was doing here was like a love tap in comparison to what he could do. It brought a whole new meaning to the term pro in Izuku's head. He'd seen All Might, he'd seen the symbol of peace fight, but those punches were nothing but single shots. Ed Shot only needed to twitch before he knocked Izuku off balance. It was amazing to look at. The mountain that was a top 10 hero. I'll do better. I know you will, Ed Shot said, his singular eye somehow curling into a slight smile. But I'd rather you not trip during your attempts. Izuku felt his face heat up in embarrassment as his eyes drifted over the remains of the eggs. T thank you. Think nothing of it. Ed Shot dismissed his apology in good humor, you're improving. Even if it doesn't seem like it. The ninja walked over to the side of the training mat and effortlessly dropped into a one-legged sitting position next to the small coffee table of food that one of the hero's sidekicks had prepared sometime during the test. He helped himself to a cracker while Izuku took only a glass of water. However, the ninja said, I believe that we can definitely say how despite your quirk's ability to enhance your body physically, it does little for fine motor skills. Izuku frowned, but nodded in agreement. It made no sense. All Might had never even so much as bent a doorknob when he was doing anything. The young hero in training had even seen the huge hero carry lunch boxes and eat without so much as bending whatever utensil sat in his oversized hands. But don't worry, the only difference between you and he is experience. Izuku jumped, crushing the cup of water in his hands. Ed shot single visible eye notched upwards. H how did? You were mumbling. The hero gleamed with mischief as he spoke, the small smile hidden behind his mask. Izuku deflated, oh thank god. For a second, he was worried that the hero had somehow figured out the connection between him and All Might. Though I can't say that he's a bad example to base yourself off of, the ninja said, your quirks are similar enough, and being the symbol of peace gives him more than enough experience. Have you asked him how he controls his? Izuku flashed back to those days on the beach, where the pro hero would talk about the feeling, the rush that one for all brings. The day that Izuku invented his egg in the microwave analogy, that was the last day that All Might had been his personal mentor. Since then, his duty to UA and everything else didn't exactly leave much time for personal training. And not really, Izuku admitted. The advice that the pro had graciously imparted was more on the feeling, the theory of how to control one for all and not the application, which, when Izuku thought about it, wasn't too surprising. All Might was doing his best, but there was only so much someone could do when they did the impossible and passed on their quirk to someone with none. Well then, food for thought, Ed Shot said wistfully, if you manage to catch him in his off hours, I'm sure that he'll explain it to you, right? Izuku agreed. It had been a while since he'd texted All Might, after all. Alternatively, you could ask your homeroom teacher. Izuku stopped. What? Ed Shot's eyebrow notched upwards. Your homeroom teacher is Eraserhead, correct? He asked, to which Izuku nodded, well then you could simply ask him. Are oh, really? Indeed, Ed Shot said, it takes a bit to pry anything out of Eraserhead, but eventually he gives you enough information to work with if he feels it is logical. The ninja stole a quick glance at Izuku's cup. He's a hard man to work with, but he means well, and with his help, I'm sure that you'll be able to match All Might one day. Or, the ninja paused, his eyes glinting in something akin to challenge. Are you willing to go beyond him, instead of simply settling to be like him? The successor to One for All nodded. It was what All Might was trusting him with after all. 
to be the next wielder of a quirk that was passed down through the generations and protected everyone. Good, Edshot said cheerfully, I'd hate to see the next generation without its admiration. We'll need a new soul to take up the mantle soon enough. Izuku felt his blood run cold as Edshot's lone visible eye found his. All might, despite his power, is not immortal, he said somberly. Izuku could only stare as the older hero's lone eye clouded over. He used to have more hair for starters, he said, trying for a joke. He's as fast and as strong as ever. But we cannot simply sit by and hope that All Might will remain effective long enough to solve all of our problems. I dread to think of a time when we will have to take to the streets without him in our corner, without his example leading us on. But it will happen, one of these days. He stood up, dusting off some crumbs. Put on your suit, we're going on patrol. Already, yes, Edshot said without a shred of hesitation. Your fine motor skills are still improving, but your general speed and awareness are better than you give yourself credit for. So for your final lesson today, the ninja shot forward, his entire body folding to a single point. A cannon blast went off in the dojo, and Izuku had to shield his eyes. Blinking away the dust, his head snapped up to Ed's shot, resting on the edge of the window. Keep up. Izuku felt his legs shake, but he smiled like he was meant to. Right? Momo sipped on the special protein shake that the cooks had provided for her as she rested in her room. She was in casual attire, no longer in her sweat-soaked Hayori, yet her arms ached. She had followed Musha's instructions, creating more blades to fill the hollow handle until the timer had rung out. She looked to the side, seeing the slit in the handle that allowed her to fill in that spot with the blades. Taking the time to clean up the dojo that now contained a mountain of dull blades took a minute, but it wasn't inconsequential. She had remembered doing similar exercises in her family's gym attached to her home. She was used to muscle burn like this, but her arms just felt dead. She doubted that Musha would have her continue the sword training, as it would only work her arms beyond the pale. Overtraining was a thing and would eventually lead to muscle degradation. Contemplating what Musha would wish for her to train and made the girl think. After she had cleaned up the dojo and showered, she got the protein shake to help with her recovery. It was large, about a pint as she was halfway done. The fact that it was also strawberry and banana flavor helped. It was delicious. She let out a sigh, looking at her hands and wincing. Bumps and sores were forming on the palms of her delicate hands. Calluses had begun to emerge from so many swings and grips of the sword handle. No pain, no gain, she murmured to herself, taking another deep sip and rolling over in bed as she now had time to herself. The fact that Momo was working under a top 10 pro hero was incredible. She'd had plenty of offers, but to know that one of Japan's best was interested in her made her giddy and filled her exhausted body with pride. She reached over for her shake, but her arms ached as she winced. Conjuring a straw, she placed it in the cup and sipped the drink from there. Wanting to check in on the latest trends, she looked over at her phone, seeing that the group chat wasn't as active as before. No doubt everyone was working hard at their internships. Looking over the news cycle her eyebrow quirked up on her social media feed. Mirko's sidekick. She clicked on the thread, and her eyes rose up. The gif was of the rabbit hero Mirko grinning and traversing the Tokyo skyline via great leaps and bounds. And behind her, swinging and running across buildings was Peter, in his brand new costume too no less. It wasn't that metallic armor he had before during the battle trials and practical exam. Looking more skin-tight and mesh-like combined with a blue and red color scheme instead of blue, red and gold. It looked like they were in Kyredo, Tokyo's southernmost ward. Wasn't Mirko based in Endo to the northeast? Then again, Mirko had been known to travel cross-country, and at times did do a revolution around Tokyo. Although, thinking about it now, she did need to ask Peter a quick question. Quick as she could, she got out her phone and sent him a message. Peter, if you can, can you call me? I want to talk to you about something important. It is concerning your web formula. Send, Momo sighed, at ease as she closed her eyes while lying on the futon only for her phone to suddenly vibrate, much to her surprise as he looked over. Hey Momo, what's up? Talk to me. And before you ask I woe seagulls. Anyways, I am on voice to text right now. Linked it up with my new mask and stuff so don't worry about me texting and swinging. It's a lot like oh wow that whale lady is huge. Whoa that cannonball. Anyway, it's a lot like that bluetooth thingy that translates your voice while you got Mirko slow down. Gonna have to gun it. Ha ha ha. So yeah, what's up? Peter-san was web-slinging it, texting, and running too by a body of water by the looks of it. His new mask had been integrated with his phone. Did he have his phone on him? She looked at the gif again, and from the angle, she couldn't see any place where he could store it. Well, if you are out on patrol, maybe we could talk later. I wouldn't want to distract you. Only for an instant response. It's cool. No worries. We can talk tonight or tomorrow night. Momo's eyes lit up. 
When you have a chance, call me. I would like to talk to you about your web formula and patents. Please. She waited, seeing the reply bubble rippling, indicating of Peter's talking. As much as she'd like to talk about the sports festival, that should be in person. Oh, patent stuff. That's important whoa. Hi Harbor Crane people. Sorry for the scare. Came Peter's reply about 30 seconds later and Momo realized that he had run into a construction crane and caused a minor scare. Momo couldn't contain her giggle as she imagined it. Tell you what, we can talk later tonight. Maybe set something up. Sound good Peter? She asked as she stretched her aching arms. Yep. Ah there's more to jump from. How many boats are there here? Geez Mirko, give a guy a break. Wait, they're going to Manana Ward. Ship jumping. They're going to the port of Tokyo now. Well, Peter was working hard on patrol. She smiled as she set her phone down. Still, what did Peter mean before in regards to swinging and texting? Had he done that before in America? Then again, their quirk laws were far more lax than Japan's, but to do something to that extent, combined with his experience, his iron spider costume, and his incredible powers, Momo's mind wandered as she began to muse more on her friend and deputy representative, taking the time to rest and relax her muscles as she did what most girls did and looked around social media, and... Wait, was that Jiru now? With deaf arms no less. Then again, with the exposure of the sports festival and the USJ attack prior, their faces were becoming more well-known throughout various circles. Her fingers began to fly as she texted her friend. You're patrolling on day one. She asked before putting her phone aside and standing up. Momo looked down. While she understood the importance of training, hopefully Musha-san could take her out on a patrol and... Her phone rang and the black-haired beauty looked down and took the phone, surprised to see that Jiru had responded back. Yeah, you at the office of Musha then? Jiru replied, I am, just relaxing after some training. It's how I found you on social media. Jiru's response was quick. OFFS, stalkers, can't leave people be even when they're in school. Divided by whelp, guess it's the price of fame or notoriety. How have you found the time to text while on patrol anyway? On break, Death Arms has been running me ragged all over Musutafu. Thankfully I don't have to live at the office, but I gotta show up there super early to compensate. But I get to work around Mount Lady and Kamui Woods too, so it's still cool, so far. Momo smiled, pleased to see that her friend was doing well. Jiru was still typing. How about you? You ought to be doing some cool stuff under a top 10. Well, I have been training mostly, relaxing and recovering for now before Musha-san returns from a patrol. I am a bit envious really. Well, if you have a boring hero career, something's wrong right? And besides, you're getting stronger. Can't complain on that. Momo frowned as she took a seat on her futon. I know, but I would like to be out there helping others. I do think that Musha-san will take me out on a patrol at some point soon. I guess it's just me being antsy and trying to catch up to everyone. I heard Asui is working under Selkie and it's basically a pseudo-coast guard hero firm where he works at. While Uraraka surely must be learning the lay of the land with the wild wild pussycats. And we know Peter is under Mirko and we know how she travels. And I'm just doing physical and quirk training. It's like I never even left school. While patrolling and gaining experience getting in practice and getting stronger. You'll do great yeah Momo. Keep your head up. Breaks almost up. Let's talk later K. Of course. Have a good patrol Jiru. Momo put her phone to the side and got back up, walking over to the bathroom connected to her room. She made it a habit to brush her teeth three times a day if she could as she walked inside, opening her bathroom bag before pulling out toothpaste and a specialized toothbrush. She got to work on brushing first, taking about two minutes before going to flossing. Using her quirk, her finger glowed as the fine floss sped out, faster than usual, which made Momo blink. By the time she had a good amount, she inspected it. She knew the materials needed like the back of her hand due to practice from mother. While making toothbrushes would be illogical since the best ones would require a more fine understanding. Floss was incredibly easy to produce, and producing a quantity like this would take about 2 to 3 seconds tops to help her last through the day. A good several feet of floss seemed to have been fired out of her finger in just under 2 seconds, if not 1. Looking at her hand, Momo began to understand as her obsidian eyes brightened. Beaming, she got to flossing with her creation and getting every crevice before gargling some Listerine. Going back into her room, she put on a new set of workout underwear in addition to a fresh training Hayori stored within the linen cabinet. Walking out, she made her way to the dojo, yet she didn't have her hollow sword with her. In her hand, she conjured a stopwatch. Everyone's getting stronger in their own way. A break once in a while never hurts, and while I can't overwork my muscles to the point of overtraining, Momo said as she opened up her Hayori over her exposed stomach and conjured a great big howitzer cannon. 
She recalled how during the race it took about 10 seconds or so. Her stopwatch was on as she stepped back as the military appliance landed on the floor. She timed it, looking at her watch. 10.24 seconds. I can still strengthen up my quirk. She smiled as she trotted over to the intercom right outside the dojo room. She pressed the button directing it to the kitchen. Excuse me, Matsumoto-san. Are you there? I am. Is this Yeyarazu? Came the culinary chief on the other end. How can I help you? I would like more of those shakes please. The recovery ones to help with muscle growth and have calories galore. Womo said with anticipation. And can you bring them up to the top floor near Musha-san's office by the dojo? I am going to be training and I will need those for me to practice my quirk. On the way, I can change up the flavors of them if you like. Having more shakes that are vanilla flavored may make you detest vanilla forever by the time your internship is up. Hehe. <laughs> the playful chef chuckled. What flavors do you have? 31. Perfect. Don't be shy about them and just do one of each please. Momo gripped her hand as she raised her elbow, readied her stopwatch, and with the timer activated, conjured a steel rod. Those usually took about 3 to 4 seconds by the time they come out of her shoulder. Time, 3.43 seconds. After all, I plan on going plus ultra. She finished as she walked back to the dojo, sat down and closed her eyes as she placed the stopwatch to the side and had her hands out in front of her. Her legs were crossed under her, forearms resting on her thighs and knees, palms facing forward. With nourishment and future lipids coming on the horizon, she wouldn't hold back. Time to create items she knew from scratch. She took a deep breath, closing her eyes as she did her best to get a clear mind. Ignore the light ambience of the city outside. Or the sound of the air conditioner. Ignore her inner thoughts. Her worries for her friends. Her doubts from her family. Focus on the steel staves. Have that picture in mind. If she could master that, she would be able to master conjuring other items in a snap. Her hands began to glow, steel rods beginning to fire out in three-second intervals over and over as they landed and clanged on the dojo mat. Hopefully Masha-san wouldn't be too upset, but these creations could serve as additional scrap for the smiths downstairs. Focus, create, conjure, breathe. Focus, create, conjure, breathe. Momo kept to this routine until she heard the first knocks on the door, with several shakes waiting for her and a floor littered with pipes. Shouta's fingers flew across the keyboard. Two days into the internship, and Shouda had barely gotten the first draft of the final test finished. A thousand different questions swirled in his head, but somehow, through coffee and the distant sound of his ashes screaming, he was able to focus on the tests long enough to get a draft that he was somewhat happy with. The written test was standard from the UA curriculum, but Aizawa made a point to put questions tangentially related to the experiences of the students, namely, the USJ. Painful as it was, it was the closest reference most of them had to live combat. Any lessons that could be pulled from that situation had to be ripped out kicking and screaming if need be. The questions were tactful of course, the last thing the school needed was talk of a student having a panic attack in the middle of a written exam. The written essay questions did state that the student could choose to answer however they saw fit, and truthfully. Besides, the written part of the UA final only covered about a third of the total grade for the final exam. The practical exam however, that was a different story and the real meat of the final. Previous years had them face an assortment of sentries supplied by Power Loader. This year however, they needed something more personal and challenging. Bakugo, Todoroki, Midoriya, Parker, and many of their other classmates would make mincemeat of anything other than the Zero Pointers. And even then the Zero Pointers would get trashed in minutes. And Shouta didn't even know if they had enough in the budget to get that much metal without recycling one of the practice cities. Though, thinking on it, that wouldn't be too bad of an idea. Not as if they were going to use it for anything else and with Power Loader's little mad lady getting the keys to his workshop. Jesus he needed a nap. Pushing his laptop aside for a moment, Shouta let a long sigh escape him. A quick nap to clear his head, and then back to work. Or at least, just a break from school in general. A terrible thought, considering the work that still needed to be done. But it was one that wormed its way into Shouta's head. Especially when he noted the stack of manga at the edge of his desk. He'd thrown the volumes there after his talk with Fukuda, obligations demanded that he not look at them afterwards. Now, there was some time, if only to keep himself sane. Picking up the first one, he scanned the cover while lazily reading over the several dozen different titles that were entertaining today's youth. Standard shounen and shoujo stories, most of it trying to recapture the magic that manga had before the emergence of quirks. That being said, Shouta had to give credit where it was due. Even with quirks emerging, and the news looking more and more like an anime come to life than most shows, authors had to adapt their mediums to survive. 
It demanded creativity, application, and persistence, three traits that Shouta could appreciate. What he couldn't appreciate was uninteresting premises, mortals fighting in a tournament against gods of old, pass. Yet another guy with the intelligence of a brick surrounded by a wish-fulfillment harem involving admittedly interesting-looking mechs, again, pass. A story of a robot. A sorcerer and a spider boy with a familiar design on his chest walking through the ruins of a post-apocalyptic city. Exhaustion left Shouta in a flash, and he sat perfectly straight in his seat, eyes wide. He stared at the story, Arachnophobia. It covered a metal man, a sorcerer and then the big image of the spider boy with the design on his chest in the center. In the corner, a celebratory tagline read out even defeated. They move on, to avenge all that they lost. It was a first anniversary chapter, with a full-color page celebrating the success of the story so far. He spotted trailing the trio was a porcupine person looking like a cowboy, his quills countless. A praying mantis girl with her eyes in a blindfold, looking similar to one of Vlad's students. And a hulk of a man riddled with tattoos and dual knives, which let Shouta see a familiar design of red, gold and black stare back up at him. The protagonist's armor. Wait a second, he recognized that armor. The design matched Parker's original design point for point. But, that would have been a copyrighted design since it was registered as part of his hero costume. No, he had to be sure. Aizawa pulled his laptop back in front of him, and as quickly as he could, he went to the student files. Each student had a designated file, a simple summary of their abilities so possible internship choices would know what they were dealing with when the student came to them. Aizawa opened Parker's file and then double-clicked on the video file labeled Entrance Exam. He had to be sure that his memory wasn't playing tricks. Not two seconds and did he pause the footage of a familiar sight. A metal-plated boy swinging through the city about to crash into a faux villain with the force of a freight train. His metal spider legs spread out. With a tap he made the image zoom in on the student's chest. He shifted his seat and carefully put the color page of the manga magazine and the feed side to side. It was like comparing the images in a mirror. The same spider insignia. No fucking way. Shouta uttered to himself. It had to be. There were only so many ways to draw a design for a spider emblem on a chest and make it practical to wear. Shouta's gaze went down, and he nearly dropped the manga when he read the name of the author. His heart stopped. Araki. There wasn't a hero in the underworld that didn't know of Araki Hayu, the dream drawer. The man's notes on how to follow through on a case were taught in police academies around the country, and even beyond. He was retired, having turned to manga out of nothing but boredom. Yet the man kept working, being one of the best detectives in Japan. Hell, even Endeavor did a work study under him back in his heyday. Some say the reason Todoroki and G was as good of a number two hero was thanks to learning under Araki. Shouta would agree. After all, when he was a first year in Class 1A, his first internship was with Araki Hayu himself. Not a flashy pro hero, but a sly and cunning detective whose quirk had a hand in dissolving countless crime rings throughout the years. And according to rumor, he still worked as a consultant for cases, provided that the case in question gave him enough ideas for whatever manga that he was currently working on since he had seen it all. Shouta quickly accessed the public safety records that were available to the government and pro heroes and did a quick search of Araki's last job. After a second, the name flashed up. Nusutafu Police Department, under the orders of Chief Fukuda and the date. The same day that Parker's vigilante report was made, he spoke to himself as he felt a rush through him. The kind of rush he lived for as an underground hero when he finally pieced the case together. Shouta tossed the manga to the side instantly, giving him a free hand to dial the number to Araki's publisher. The phone rang twice, and a female voice asked, Seinen Leap, how? This is the pro hero Eraserhead. Aizawa interrupted, ignoring the gasp on the other end of the line. I have a few questions regarding Araki Hayu's manga. Eh? Hey, a pro hero? Can I? Here is my ID code. Shouta stated, speaking his ID that confirmed him as a pro hero that could get him access to certain records when people were apprehensive. Now, I'd like to ask some questions, hopefully to Araki Sensei himself. Shouta would have called the man himself, but Araki only ever contacted Shouta through third parties, trying to stay on the down low. That and he didn't have Araki's phone number after all these years. I, I see. Well, Eraserhead Sam, I would love to help you, but Araki Sensei isn't in today. He only ever comes to the publisher when he turns in his manuscripts for the monthly magazine. The receptionist responded and Shouta closed his eyes. Made sense. With a quirk like Dream Draw, Araki has made himself a target in the eyes of the dying crime organizations and some villains could aim to make a name for themselves if they saw him out too much in public. 
I take it you do not have his address either? Shouda inquired. No sir, he hasn't given us a billing address. He accepts his payment only in cash. Shouda nodded as he began to write down some notes off to the side. I see, do you know when he will be in? He asked, eyeing the calendar, pen ready for this week. It will be next month I'm afraid. He delivered this month's manuscript yesterday. The dark-haired man swallowed down a curse and breathed through his nose. Okay then, is it the beginning, middle, or end of the month when you guys publish your next issue? Beginning, sir. Shouta looked at the calendar. Next June, first weekend. Does the first Saturday of June work? Um, he comes in on Fridays. Does that help? It does. Thank you very much. I am working on a little project and I would like his consultation. Well, good luck with that. Araki Sensei is very fickle on when he chooses to consult and assist on criminal or litigation cases, sir. Oh, don't worry. Shouta eyed the pause video of Peter Parker crushing a three-pointer during the practical. I have one that has his interest. Thanks again. He hung up and took a deep breath. All right, Parker. Next month, I'm going to get to the bottom of you. He muttered. No matter what. Shouta's tired eyes went to his final exam paperwork as he minimized the video feed. Gotta finish your final and how to truly test you. Yeah, ha 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 ha. Peter whooped as he jumped off the nose of an oil freighter, firing a webline and swinging across the water as his hand skimmed the surface. He came up at the top of the swing and flipped, landing atop a shipping freighter as he chased after the very familiar sign of Mirko. In his jubilation he had fallen behind again. He sprinted across the tops of the freight containers as he jumped before he saw her jumping silhouette. Like Jack Septice I would say, Hardcore Parker. He yelled as he jumped to the top of a freight crane and ran along the iron beam at the topmost part. Your endorphin levels are above normal parameters, Peter. Karen stated in his ear as he jumped off, eyeing a nearby skyscraper as he saw Mirko run through the streets. He fired a webline and swung from the skyscraper as he crossed through the other end of the port of Tokyo. He swung and pulled, flinging himself higher as he flipped and twirled in the air. Man, he couldn't wait until they got to Shinjuku. All those buildings to swing off of. He twirled and landed in a tumble as he broke out in a fast sprint down the sidewalk, Mirko still running on ahead by a good 50 meters. People blurred past them as Peter could just barely make them out. To finally just cut loose, swing and feel the air under him and run without care. It was like being back in New York all over again. And the thought of the day where he graduated and became a pro made Peter salivate. Thank you so much, Mr. Fukuda. Phew. He thought in his head as he jumped up to a lamp post and took off, firing a webline as he observed Mirko leap over buses and onto an office building. He saw her gesture with her hand as she looked back, urging him to follow. Gotcha. He took off at the top of the swing and yelled out a yahoo as he twirled in midair, readjusting as Mirko on the ground waved at him. He landed on the ground, tumbling forward to a stop before he hopped back up to his feet. Peter was grinning from ear to ear. Oh, that was fun, I bet, Mirko said with a smirk, hands on her hips as she looked up at the taller American boy. I heard you hooting and hollering ever since we crossed Takodane Award. Hehe, <laughs> yeah, Peter smiled bashfully. Just, it's been a long time since I've done this and, oh, I can tell, your landings were a bit shaky. But this isn't your first rodeo, Mirko pointed at him. Let me guess, back in America you did some vigilante shit on the side, right? Peter perked up, blinking. Oh um, um yeah, I did kinda say that just now, didn't I? Yeah did. And relax. Mirko waved her gloved hand in front of her face as her toned caramel physique shone with a fine sheen of sweat. I ain't gonna report it or anything. What you did back in the States doesn't mean much here. Well, at least to me. She pointed up and Peter followed her hand, seeing a beef bowl place. Satanaka's bowl was the name of the establishment. He could feel people pause and stare at them as many of them took photos and talked amongst themselves. Holy crap, it's the number 7 hero Mirko. Oh my gosh, she's so awesome. Who's the spider looking guy next to her though? Is that her date? No way, is she finally taking a sidekick? Seemed to be drawing a crowd. Karen texted as Peter perked up, looking at the letters read across his HUD. Why hadn't she just spoke as Norma? Rabbits have super ears. You wouldn't want to explain me to her right. Peter nodded lightly. Just don't let hero critics hear about it, or they'll trip over themselves ripping into ya. Come on, let's get some lunch. Peter looked to the clock in his HUD. It was half past noon after all. Sure, he said with a smile as he followed the rabbit hero inside, ignoring some of the people who were talking to themselves as they entered. It looked like a normal hole in the wall as people looked up. Peter quirked an eyebrow at the sudden attention as he bit his lower lip under his mask. Marco just grinned and waved at everyone as they muttered and gossiped to themselves. This is just an intern, showing him the ropes as I do a walk around the neighborhood. No sidekick or anything, Marco stated. 
Now then, we're here to have some grub before we resume our rounds, so just respect our space and no one gets a toe sandwich. Toe sandwich. Peter spoke to himself as he followed her inside to the counter. The girl with short blonde hair and a cap blew a gum bubble out of her mouth as she looked on with relative boredom at the sight of the top 10 hero in front of her. Ah, Mirko special, she asked plainly as she went to work behind the register. You know me too well. Is Satanaka in? She's in the back. She knows what to do. The girl's brown eyes turned towards Peter. What would you like, sir? Um, um well. Peter looked up at the menu and squinted his eyes. Order big. You need the calories to get you through the day. Mirko mused. Say, Mirko, who is this guy anyway? Asked the register girl as Peter perked up. Her tone now excited. Boredom leaving her. Wait a second. You're that American kid Peter Parker. I recognize you from the UA. Sports festival. You're spider boy, right? It's who. He felt the register girl's eyes on him again as he patted his cheeks. Spider man. The girl simply blew a bubble out and shrugged. Fair enough, what can I get you? Okay. He just needed to get over the fact that secret identities didn't mean Jack anymore. Just, the XL double meat please. Peter ordered as she tapped it in. Charge it to my firm, you know the number. Mirko waved as she walked off, motioning for Peter to follow. She sat down at the first available booth. Peter took his seat across from her. So, come here often. I mean, if you have a secret menu item named after ya. Yep, one of my favorite hole in the walls. Mirko lounged back and stretched as a man came by with cups, filling them with water. Finally, drink up and hydrate, Parker. When you're on patrols like this, it pays to make sure you're at full strength. Wouldn't do any good being hungry or dehydrated on the job. That's sure. Peter lifted up the edge of mask, taking the water and sipping as Mirko chugged from her glass right across from him. Not taking off the mask, eh? She asked, smirking. Not really. Still, kinda getting used to it. Back at home, he would make sure that he was in a secluded place before he would ever think of taking off his mask. Sure, he could take half of it off in order to eat or drink something quick but to just casually dine in his Spider-Man costume with other people even knowing his name around him. He still couldn't shake off that awkward feeling. Related to your vigilante stuff you did back in the States, right? Kind of. Had to keep my identity hidden back then. She didn't really know all the details, and what vigilante laws Peter had studied up when he arrived in this world told him that America was more lenient with vigilantism depending on the context of things more so than Japan. It was kind of like what he remembered of gun laws. Then again, America was the birthplace of the hero profession since they took inspiration from comic books and stuff. After an incident I, well, found myself here. Had to get away huh? Piss off the wrong people. Peter frowned as he sighed. Not like I had a choice. Well, it's not like you're just wilting away and dying. You're standing up on your own, and you made me actually put in effort. Peter looked back at the smiling white-haired woman. Not many can keep up with me when I'm on the run. So, you wanted us to go on patrol throughout Tokyo so you could see if I can keep up. Kinda. I knew you were fast, saw that during the sports festival. Mirko stretched her arms. But you were always the one in the lead. How do you react when you were trailing another is what I wanted to see. And you handled it pretty well. Outside of the times I heard you mumbling to yourself and loss in focus. Peter blanched. Yeah, talk to text. Why yeah, just kinda talking to myself. Hehe. <laughs> That's something I noticed during the festival as well. You really like fucking talking. Mirko leered, and she leaned forward. Granted, you were able to back it up, but it was still a distraction. Anyway, her ears twitched and her body tensed up as Peter perked up at her frowning. Outside the restaurant, a car zoomed past, breaking every conventional speeding law around. Sirens were audible in the distance as well. Mirko got up from her seat and raced out of the restaurant. Peter close behind her as people jerked in surprise. As one, they looked down the road and watched as a van nearly crashed into oncoming traffic. Without words, Peter understood what to do as he saw police cars coming in hot. His mentor leapt over a building, Peter keeping up with a line of web. He swung overhead, keeping the van in sight as well as he could. Mariko landed hard on a building close by, and apparently, that was the sign that the driver needed to floor it. The van took off, and there were too many people down the road. Peter whipped out a line of web, slingshotting himself over traffic. He grabbed hold of a streetlight, using it as a launch pad to throw himself to the sidewalk. Parallel to the ground, he threw out a line of web between the two poles, the one he launched from as well as the one he landed next to, creating a fence that stopped anyone from crossing the street. Several people yelped in surprise, but that was better than them getting hit. The van swerved and took off down another street than risk getting caught in a giant web. Another swing got him back overhead and closer to the van. A tingle ran across his back before he pulled on his webline to jerk himself higher, 
and he saw Mirko fly in where he once was. Watch it, he yelled in English. You have your precog. You're fine. She yelled back as she got to the road, sprinting after the rogue vehicle in a blur. Up ahead, the van was getting to an intersection, with a dozen cars already in the lane of oncoming noon traffic. There wasn't enough time to get ahead of it. No time to take it out from the side without endangering anyone. So he launched twin lines of webbing that latched onto the back end of the van's frame. Mirko, he screamed as she looked back, leaping back up towards him as Peter flew. Instantly, the rabbit-themed hero was next to him. He cut the lines, and she grabbed both, connecting them to the bottom of her feet. The van was about to hit someone who had fallen over on the crosswalk. They went taut the second the rabbit hero slammed against the ground, digging up asphalt. She dug a good two feet into the ground, and the leverage forced the car to jerk to a stop as it jostled and rattled. Marco moved a bit, but the van stopped meters before the intersection, as well as the terrified individual huddled up behind his briefcase. Peter landed next to the van's driver's side window and saw that both passengers were out of it, slammed against their airbags and groaning. One of them looked to be made entirely of dice alongside a normal-looking bald guy. He webbed them up just in case. I'm gonna have to check on my boots, Mariko grumbled, walking up as she looked down at her white rabbit-based footwear. But not half bad, not the way I would have done it. But hey, she smirked at Peter with that same old dangerous toothy smirk. At least you're not useless. Peter didn't know what he had expected. Ooh, thanks. What's going on here? A voice said as Peter turned, and in came a blonde-haired centaur riding in, her top human half encased in a policewoman's uniform. Ah, uh, we got us some thugs, she said, hands on her hips as she smiled, turning towards Mirko. As expected of you, Mirko-san. Don't mention it. You can thank my buddy here for tying them up. The police lady looked over to Peter, who waved back. I didn't think you'd taken a sidekick like this, Mirko-san. Sidekick. PFFFT, no. Mirko scoffed. Just an intern for the next two weeks. Anyways, you can note me in your report. I'm going back to my lunch break. She waved as she noted the cameras on her. Peter looked around, seeing other people taking pictures or videos with their phones and cameras. He waved awkwardly before trotting back with Mirko into Satanakas. Okay, Mirko reclaimed her seat, waiting on Peter to do the same. So, notice anything? Yeah, how did you know they were coming? Peter asked, lifting up his mask a bit to expose his mouth as the two went back to sipping their drinks and conversing. Marco's ears twitched and flexed to and fro as Peter's eyes went up. Then his masked eyes widened. You could hear them from here. With all these people. Yeah, rabbits have acute hearing after all. Marco explained as she leaned back. I trained myself to pick up certain noises back when I was your age and starting out back in UA. If I had to act fast, I needed to ensure that I could stop any crime from taking place, or at least prevent it from getting worse. You heard all of that from inside here and in town. Mirko pointed at the open windows of the restaurant. This place has open windows. I can pick out the sound of blades being sharpened or prepped too. It's why I prefer going to beef bowl places. Not as much knife work in the kitchens to interfere, with the meat being cut up with scissors or a pre-cut in the early mornings. Must be hard though, having super ears like that. I mean, there has to be so much background noise going on. Peter said in amazement. The fact that Mirko pulled that feet off was astonishing. Then again, she was in the top 10 after all. Yeah, it can be rough but I deal with it. She shrugged. I'll probably get tinnitus in a couple of years to cause of it. So, you're gonna lose her hearing. That doesn't make you concerned at all. I won't lose all of it. I'll just have an occasional ringing sound and shit going on. Not like I'm gonna be retiring early or anything. I'll just have to consult doctors and take preventative measures. You saw me with those unique earmuffs in the gym, right? I tend to wear those casually when I can so I can lessen the impact on my hearing. Mirko pointed up at her long rabbit ears. Not all quirks are entirely winners. Some of them have their drawbacks too, and you just have to live with it, like how any other person has a condition and shit. Peter sipped at his water, deep in thought as he took that advice in. That does make sense. You did practice what you preach though, being proactive. Of course, being a hero means having eyes in the back of your head and ears pointed in all directions. Naturally, I have super hearing so whenever I hear something of a crime about to be committed, I do my best to stop it, as you've seen. She pointed at Peter, and you need to learn how you can be proactive in your own way. She smiled as her ears twitched again. Peter saw her glance to the side before focusing her ruby eyes back on him. Not saying you copy me, but see what you have and try to apply it in how you can prevent crimes from happening. She grinned as she looked to the side. Ah, here we are. Peter saw the waiter place down his large beef bowl, filled with beef and noodles and various vegetables in front of him. 
Before him was a similarly sized bowl, but with a lot more vegetables inside. No meat. Vegetarian. Peter inquired. And proud of it, Marco split her chopsticks up before she blinked, ear twitching. On second thought, I'm gonna use the loo. She got up. Can you hold down the fort for me? Um, sure, Peter said as he brought out his chopsticks. Mirko jogged over to the side, going into a bathroom. Hey you, said an English voice as Peter perked up, looking up towards the doorway as he saw a man in a beige coat carrying a briefcase. He was pointing at him. You're with Rumi Yuzajiyama, Mirko the rabbit hero, ain't ya? Um, yeah, I am. Peter said as he saw the man, clearly an American, approach. If I hadn't known any better from the footprint you were the one to web it up. That van I mean. I noticed you made some kind of fence to corner in those guys, didn't ya? Thinking on the fly. Ha. Huh. Fly. Spider. Fits I say. He beamed, pleased with himself as Peter winced to himself. They're not related at all. What's your name, young hero? Said the man, who looking at him he was a Caucasian man with a buzzed head and thick mustache. Oh, it's ooh, Spider-Man. Just Spider-Man. Peter said, shaking off any dust. Do you need any help at all, sir? Me? I'm fine. You saved my life even. Now I won't have to explain to my wife how I wound up either in a casket or an emergency room halfway across the globe. The moustached man grinned as he spoke in English. Still, to think I would meet you a.s. Golden Boy, Peter Parker, all the way out here. He smiled, ignorant of some stares as the man and Peter spoke in English in a prominently Japanese restaurant. This business trip is paying off in ways I couldn't even count. Still, your accent. Which burrow? Peter perked up as he tried to make sense of all that. But he did catch that last bit. Wait, you from New York? Yep, downtown Manhattan. I'm from Queens actually, Peter said excitedly. Queens, eh? My wife was from there. Nice place. You lived up to that moniker of yours people have. While your deed may not be on the official record, I will make sure you will get the due credit you deserve. Well, uh, thank you. Just you know, doing what heroes do. Peter shrugged as the man was helped down. Mr. Manhattan patted him on the shoulder before he perked up at his smartwatch ringing. All right, got a meeting to attend to. Meeting up with some bigwig journalist on a podcast in person. Got invited to attend and both people will be speaking in English. Plus I can write some pieces on Hero Society in Japan for the paper back home. Manhattan mused as he held out his hand. Peter took it. Well, I gotta go finish my lunch with Murko-san. I mean, Miss Murko. You take care of yourself, Mr. Manhattan. The man beamed as he picked up his briefcase, closing his eyes warmly. Just call me Stanley, kid. He said as he walked out with a wave. Peter took his seat at the booth. He saw Mirko saunter over to her seat, plopping down. You talking to someone? Heard you run in your mouth in English. The bronze-skinned Amazon mused as Peter leaned back and grinned. Yeah, just that guy we saved thanking us. It felt good saving people. Doing good deeds. Sure that was a bit scary going through that mess but... The thrill of jumping and swinging through buildings. The adrenaline rush of acting fast. It was a high Peter lived for. Mirko smiled. Gotta say, with that webline idea. Nice job, Parker. You acted fast and on your feet. She complimented before she picked up her chopsticks and grabbed some stir-fry veggies and noodles. Thanks for the meal. Peter also began to eat. Thanks for the meal. So, how are you able to do it? Mirko asked. Your precognition. When I took off that one time I knew you were gonna avoid me when I made myself thin to get past ya. She looked up as she finished slurping away at some noodles. Do you have a name for your little special move or ability? Special move. You don't have any super hearing like me do you? And with you facing away from me and those other times at the sports festival, you couldn't have seen me coming, as well as those invisible kids back during the war. Mirko grabbed more stir fry and began to stuff her face some more. Oh well. How to explain this? Peter mused. I sensed it coming. With my, um, sixth sense, I guess. Although precognition isn't. What I would call it. Peter bit his lip as he swallowed some meat. What would you call it then? Ooh, Haven't really decided on it. Been working with Peter Tingle in my head. Mirko stopped eating. And her red eyes went from her veggie bowl to Peter, eyes wide in disbelief. Peter. Tingaru. She uttered in heavily accented English. Peter gulped. Yes. That's fucking retarded. Mirko spat out as she drank some water. Your quirk is called spider right. She jotted down on a finger, to which Peter nodded. You said this was a sixth sense right. Peter nodded again. She clapped her hands. Spider sense. You're welcome. She boasted, arms wide as she leaned back into her seat. Peter opened his mouth as Mirko went back to eating. Peter tingle. For fuck's sake. She muttered under her breath as Peter puckered her lips. Yeah, spider sense was definitely better. Um, thanks. I'll work with that. You better. I ain't going to intern someone who makes clown super moves or ability names. Mirko added as an aside. Let's scarf this down. 
we gotta cut through Musutafu then be in Shinjuku by sundown before we can head on back to the firm. Won't have dinner until we get back. You got it. Peter shrugged as he saw her lift up the bowl and began to slurp down the bowl as if he would with milk in a cereal bowl. He needs to eat this fast, so he began to dig faster into his beef bowl with urgency. The bar was simple, but that was probably the point. Insane villains wouldn't be able to keep hidden if they at least couldn't put on a simple front. Akaguro Chisholm kept his hands at his sides, inches from his weaponry as he made a show of looking around the little bar. No traps, but those could be easily hidden, even from him. His eyes shifted back to the warp quirk user, his entire body shifting in that smoky substance. It formed around in a humanoid shape, but it could simply be a distraction. The brace might be his only means of entry, but that didn't mean that a simple nick along his shoulder wouldn't do the trick. The real question came down to the so-called leader that the warp user brought him in to talk to. He was a kid, but only in the physical sense. Hands dotted his body, covering his arms and the back of his head but letting his face remain open. Chapped lips and narrowed blood-red eyes studied Chisholm. The hero killer known as Stain recognized the look. A mad predator waiting for the chance to strike. He thought that he was invincible here. Definitely a child. So, what's this about a deal? Stain asked, playing the curious customer. I was told that I needed someone like you in my party, the boy said. His fingers dug into the countertop, and Stain could see four distinct lines trace themselves on the wooden surface. He wasn't impressed. And is that supposed to mean something to me? Stain asked, eyes hardening. I don't think you understand what you're even talking about. Enlighten me, the boy drawled. Stain scoffed. No matter what you want to accomplish, it is necessary to have conviction and desire. Those without it and those who are weak will be weeded out. Looking over you, I see nothing. He eyed the boy, waiting for even the slightest movement, the edge that showed his true self. There was nothing. No matter, Stain had plenty more to say. He was a waste of air. This society is already overgrown with fake heroes, where the word itself has lost its true meaning. And the criminals they fight are little more than children who wave around their powers like toys. He reached for his katana, the warp gate user tensed, but he wouldn't be fast enough. All those like that should be purr. Do you ever stop talking? Stain froze, instinct and confusion forcing the action. The boy finally lifted his head, his shaggy eyes looking at the hero killer. Boredom, annoyance, both emotions flashed in his eyes. I don't give a fuck if you've got some vendetta against every costumed piece of shit that walks down the street. All I care about. He gripped the table, and the wooden surface turned to ash under his fingers. This boy was dangerous, far more dangerous than he initially seemed. Stain kept on guard, watching as the villain stood up. His eyes were burning with madness, his bloodthirsty grin too wide on his chapped face. Is turning all might into this, along with this entire pathetic society full of trash that worships shit like him? Got it. Oh, so that's how he wanted to play it. A show of strength. Puff up his collar like an animal trying to make itself bigger. It wouldn't stop him, but it did make things more interesting. Stain licked his lips in anticipation. Yes, you've made that abundantly clear that our motives oppose one another. The madness gave way to surprise. What are you talking about? The villain asked. We both want to tear this fucking society down. I'm just not dressing it up in all your fancy words. Stain smirked. That statement just proved everything he needed to know and more. You want to do more than simply tear it down. I intend to cull the weak, the fakes that pollute the world. You, you want to bring everything down, tear down the real and fake heroes till nothing's left. And why shouldn't I? The boy tilted his head, and that smile stretched over his lips. What has it done to me, to you, to Kirajiri or any other fuckers that call themselves villains? It's the one that tears us down, it's the one that labels us the villains. It'll get what's coming to it, so if you can't understand that. His fingers twitched, and Stain brought his knife to bear. Then you're no use to me. Tamira, the warp quirk user spoke, please reconsider what you're saying. This man could be a valuable asset. He won't be, the boy interrupted. He's too busy looking down on us from his pedestal that lets him see real and fake heroes. The whites of his eyes were bloodshot. I hate villains like him. Then that means we're done here, Stain said, sheathing his blade. No shit. Kirajiri, send him back, the boy drawled, going back to his seat and shooing him away. The bartender nodded, and started spreading his mist to envelop the air around Stain. Wait, that one word, whispered, yet it cut through all the air. Stain swore he could hear a pin drop as the boy turned back, pointing a single, lanky finger at the hero killer. I nearly forgot to say something. If you come back here, thinking that I'm not the real deal or some shit. He clenched his fingers, and Stain saw drops of blood fall from his palm. I'll kill you. The declaration was said with the confidence of a king declaring the law. 
There was no hesitation, no fear, and absolutely no doubt that he would be able to carry out that kind of threat. A villain with a quirk as powerful as his, and he didn't even need to use it to make Chisholm believe him. So it was no surprise when the hero killer smiled. And I'll pay close attention to what you do, Stain declared. If you are the real deal, that is. He added the last part of his statement with a smirk. He saw a shot glass being grabbed by the snarling youth, and then the dark fog took him away, with the glass flying through the space where his head once was. It had been three days into internships, and so far, Tsunotori Pony had been soaring while Bakugo Katsuki crashed and burned. Tsunotori let out a yell as she lashed out with a backhand, avoiding a palm blast as an explosion erupted out. Bakugo was knocked off his feet, landing on the ground back first. Again, again, Sakamoto Kuga said, arms crossed as he observed his two young charges spar. Tsunotori had been civil, professional, taking this seriously in a manner he saw at the sports festival that had compelled him to send the American-born girl an invitation in the first place. She was absorbing all the knowledge that the killer whale hero had to offer without a single retort or complaint. Although, there were times he would see her looking off to the side, thinking to herself. The times he saw her in the cafeteria scowling at her phone made him curious as to why. Thankfully, such occasions were rare and she didn't show any lack of focus whenever she was invited out on patrol. For Bakugo, he was doing his best to catch up, and the first positive sign was the fact that he was finally using his quirk. From the last phone call he made with the guardian of Tsunotori and to Bakugo's parents, the latter's family was relieved even saying that after the sports festival he hadn't used his quirk once since his defeat on the national stage. But while his quirk usage was still there, the fiery resolve and confidence to follow through on his tactics and techniques, combined with the determination to fight through adversity, was lacking. Whenever he had Bakugo and Tsunotori spar with his sidekicks and even between themselves, Bakugo would more often than not end up on the losing end. As the ash blonde got back up, he threw his arms back to charge with Turbo, rushing in a straight line as Kuga narrowed his eyes. The speed he had demonstrated back at the sports festival. This Turbo was nowhere near as fast and explosive. Tsunotori reacted, firing two horns at him, the sharp ends flipping over and darting forward with the blunt ends pointed at her opponent. Bakugo ducked the projectiles, twirling in mid-air only to get a shoulder tackle from a charging American on all fours. The Japanese boy gasped and his momentum had him crash back onto the ground, only to have the two projectiles slam into him and drive his body back towards Tsunotori who was in a handstand, who acted accordingly with a two-pronged hoof kick to his sides. Orca winced. That blow looked like it hurt. Bakugo was sent into the air as Tsunotori pushed herself into the air with a flip, landing on her horns as they floated under her. She took aim, narrowing her eyes as she fired a third horn. Bakugo reacted, firing an explosive blast at the projectile. That's new. Kuga mused under his breath, arms once again crossed. Her control had expanded beyond two horns and onto three it seems. Her practice with her quirk was paying off. While the horns on her feet wobbled, the burnt horns clattered to the ground and from the smoke, an additional horn came through, firing with conviction and control as it flipped to its flat end and slammed into Bakugo who didn't react in time. He yelped and rolled across the ground before stopping, arms shaking as he tried to get up. That's enough, Kuga raised an arm, stepping in as Tsunotori obeyed, hopping off her arms and turning towards the towering pro hero. Shower up and rest, we'll go on patrol in two hours time. If you need to visit the infirmary, do so. Yes, Orca Sam. Tsunotori bowed respectfully, stepping away and heading towards the main dorms as she paused, looking at the panting Bakugo who was on his knees. Stoically, she turned and made her way out of the gym. Orca walked over, his lumbering form towering over the exhausted blonde as he looked up. Cougar reached into the pocket of his massive killer whale coat and handed him a washcloth to wipe up the sweat. The boy took it, wiping his face. You've lost your drive, boy, he observed. It's nothing. I need to focus. You're going to need more than focus, Cougar replied. Your style is completely out of sync. Your body is reacting, yet you hold back and are unable to follow through. Bakugo growled, looking away. I know. Then if you know, follow through and defeat your opponent. Orca growled, and the blonde gripped his knee with his hand. I'm trying. You were able to defeat her before. What's the problem now? Kuga crossed his arms again, looking down at him. This time, Bakugo gave no answer, looking away as if he didn't want to answer, yet he knew. Kuga sighed. I'll teach you a method that will help clear your head. Bakugo looked back up finally. 
The towering whale man pulled out his special custom phone and tapped the screen several times. It will be valuable as well, as we plan on covering ways of stress relief and flexibility, both of which are important for heroes like us. We will do it together tonight after our patrol. Now get cleaned up and showered. We're going to be covering the marina tonight. The town festival will be taking place this weekend, so we will need to know the area like the back of your hand. Well, you and Tsunotori at least. With his peace said and with a flourish of his black and white orca cape, Gang Orca marched away. Gang Orca, Kuga paused, looking back with a red eye as Bakugo got to his feet. What are we gonna be doing? Yoga, Kuga said. Rest up. You have. He looked up at the clock again. An hour and fifty-five minutes before I expect you to be out in the lobby in your gear. That is all. The skyrise of Tokyo passed in a blur as a blob of green lightning zipped across the rooftops. A single step effortlessly carried Izuku from one rooftop to the next. The wind roared in his ears, his feet skipping across the roofs like he weighed nothing. And words failed to describe how it felt. All his life, Izuku had dreamed what it would be like to have a quirk, to have power and do what he wanted to do. Now, with one for all, that dream was a reality. A reality that was better than he could have ever hoped for. He leapt from the corner of a roof, latching onto the fire escape and using it like a gymnast rod to swing himself forward even farther. The power in his limbs coiled and shot out, making the world blur once more. When it refocused again, Izuku was soaring straight over two buildings, only to realize mid-flight that he wouldn't make it to the last one. He'd hit pavement. A scream built up in his lungs as he began to flail his arms and legs, only to be cut short as a thin line wrapped itself around Izuku. Like a retracting claw it carried him over to the other side of the street, setting him down next to a waiting edge shot. Remember what I said about exercising restraint. Why yes sir, Izuku stammered, I just got. His apology was cut short at the sound of a gentle chuckle from the pro. Caught up in the moment, Edgeshot smiled before patting him on the head. Ah, uh, first time rooftop hopping. Seems like it was just yesterday that I met that unsure little boy outside of my agency. It was three days ago, Izuku pointed out. Edgeshot ignored him, giving an exaggerated sniffle while wiping a tear from his eye. You've grown up so much. Ooh, Edgeshot smiled. Keep your head this time he said before leaping away, body folding in on itself to make the ninja hero vanish. This time, Izuku measured his steps, taking a deep breath before every jump, just to get the control down. You should have seen me when I realized how to manipulate my way through the sound barrier, Ed Shot said, stretching himself over a ventilation shaft. I was shooting off like a rocket, made my old sensei livid trying to keep up. I can't imagine what kind of training you went through, Izuku said, leaning a little too hard on a rooftop. His sneakers left him prints, and he felt really bad, but he had to keep up. I mean, I've heard a lot of theories. Oh, the ninja said, his visible eye quirking in surprise and amusement. Izuku beamed. Yeah, they said that you left society and trained with master assassins in the Kaizo Mountains where they taught you the art of stealth. People say that they were grooming you to become the next heir to their assassin cult so you could send their ninja all across Japan and conquer it from within. Edshot stopped at the edge of a roof, his single eye blinking. The green-haired boy blushed, clamming up. See course I don't believe them. It's just a stupid idea that people made up to try and put some story to your background so of course it doesn't make any. Ah, uh, the cult of control, Ed Shot said, I was wondering when someone would piece together their whereabouts. Izuku blinked once, twice. Ed Shot shook his head, wistfully looking into the distance, perhaps to that same mountain range. Kaizo, those were the days. Training began at dawn and only ended when my masters told me it was over. Brutal training, dodging the strikes of a dozen fighters while I balanced on a single spike. Swordplay on a frozen lake, where one mistake dropped me into the frigid waters below. Izuku didn't know what to say, this was so cool. This was the backstory of the ninja hero, and he was explaining it to him. Where the heck was his notebook? He had to write this down, this was the biggest piece of lore added to Ed Shot's profile. Of course then I would stop watching old superhero movies after a night of drinks and snacks and train at a dojo in downtown Tokyo. Izuku deflated like a balloon as he limply fell to the roof. It was fake, of course it was fake. Sorry to destroy your dreams. I it's fine. Though, I must admit, the hero said, crossing the gap between buildings with Izuku close by. It is rather amusing to hear what people come up with for my origin story. It's, Izuku screamed, steadying himself from a less than graceful landing. Just that everyone doesn't know very much about you. You've only taken three interviews, and all of them were from your debut. Though, something on your mind, young Midoriya? Edshot asked, stopping at the edge overlooking the town square. Below them, the bustling streets were crowded with everyday civilians trying to get to work, or school, 
or simply find something to do with their time as the day went by. Izuku awkwardly took a spot next to him, letting the aura of one for all drop. The fizzle of electrical energy left him feeling like he'd just finished a marathon, but unlike other times, it felt like he was just taking off a heavy coat. I was wondering, why don't you take interviews? The ninja glanced to the side, why do you ask? I it's just that you're in the top 10, and the others average at least one every two months. Except for me, Ed shot finished. Izuku nodded. A fair question. Truth be told I didn't enter the game aiming for the top. All Might deserved the screen time and the praise, and I realized very early on that it wasn't for me. Ed Shot said, As so you didn't want to be in the top 10. It was a dream of mine, Ed Shot admitted. There's no student of a hero academy that graduates without hoping to earn themselves one of the coveted top 10 spots. I'm simply lucky that my he stopped. Chuckling slightly, mysterious persona allowed for a fanbase. I was simply filling the best role that I could, wasn't trying to gain anything. It simply worked out in my favor. Izuku nodded, taking in every word, only to frown. Role. Like as a hero, precisely, Ed Shot said, single eye smiling down at his intern. As smart and as talented of heroes that we are, there's a simple lesson that seems to go over everyone's heads. He pointed down at the people. Look at them. Do you think they can see us? Izuku squinted, watching the dozens of people go by. Yet as he watched, none of them looked up. In fact, none of them bothered to so much as look at the person next to them. They can't see us, but we still help where we can. Ed Shot said, we are unnoticed, yet we can do good. As shining a beacon that he is, not every hero needs to be someone like All Might. As much as we might want to, we cannot simply hope to copy what he is for generations to come. Every one of us needs to decide how we will give everyone hope. Some heroes, like myself, work best in the shadows, watching out for the things that try to take out the symbols that people do look up to. Hugh, he stopped, and Izuku got the feeling that the hero was smiling behind his mask. You'll know what kind of hero you'll need to be soon, I can tell. Izuku didn't know what to say. He just stared at the ninja, no, the hero as he rose from his position. For now, I think it's time we return to base. Nothing to report and that gives us plenty of time to work on your fine control the rest of the day, Deku. Izuku shot to his feet, one for all coursing over him. I'll do it. You better, we're running out of chopsticks. Can't imagine you liking those protein bars constantly either. Izuku's shoulders slumped and Ed Shock couldn't help but laugh. Jeez. Peter yelped as he avoided a kick from Mirko, both now decked out in practice boxing gear. Custom made to repel even gunshots the pro heroine said. But those kicks and jabs he had avoided might as well be on par if not more dangerous than bullets. Especially the kicks. Come on. Counterattack. The bronze heroine egged him on with a dangerous grin, throwing more haymakers with her gloves as Peter deftly dodged each strike by a hair of his protective mask that is. Peter ground his teeth and threw a punch, only for the rabbit hero to sidestep and Peter's spider sense blared in warning. He jumped back, avoiding a sweeping kick that sent a gust of wind out as he stepped backward, arms raised. Mirko got back up, bouncing on her feet as she let out an audible groan. I said, and she jumped up, glaring. Then she vanished and spider sense. Peter ducked as Mirko kicked at the spot where his head was only a moment before. Counterattack. They had been doing this all morning. The last two days had consisted of patrol duty after the first day in small film study. He had kept up well with her, helping snatch up some robbers and purse snatchers on their way around the greater Tokyo area. It was the most fun Peter had found yet, going through the buildings and web slinging around. It was clear that the rabbit hero noticed and took it upon herself to shake things up. And now he was here sparing with her in padded gear, jabbing at her as fast as he could, only for Mirko to make herself skinny with a pivot, avoiding the punch to the abdomen as he slowed down, and Peter ducked under the slinging punch. He felt the sense flare as he raised a hand to his face and caught the knee that sent him off his feet into the rubber mat of the sparring gym. He skidded back, grunting with each landing as he skipped like a thrown stone on a pond. She ish, she hit hard. I saw that, you slowed down. Mirko jawed, hands on her hips as Peter rolled back to his feet and got back up, sweat glistening off of him and her. What? Afraid to hurt a pro hero or something? And no. I mean. Then what? She barked. You could have gotten a good kidney shot on me but you didn't. Why? Peter bit his lip and looked to the side. I mean. What? I'm not a big enough girl for ya. She egged him on, bending over as Peter noticed her. Chest bounced lightly. That'll go over well when a villain with a pussy decides to mug a bank and shit. Imagine that. You, the friendgery neighbor Hudo Spider-Man. She was mocking as she spoke in quotes and in a mocking voice. He regretted giving out his title when he helped that lady catch her dog off the leash now. A little. Let's a villain get off easy because of chivalry and you wanted to stick it in her. 
That's not true, Peter yelled, indignant. Mirko smirked. Prove it then. We've been at this for two hours and you still haven't laid a good hit on me. Mirko licked her lips and grinned dangerously. Your endless stamina ain't worth fucking nothing if you can't follow through on subduing a villain of any gender, creed, or race. Now get your ass off the mat and come at me. She beckoned, bouncing on her feet as Peter stood up, taking a deep breath. So, you want me to go faster? Yeah, show me those moves you did in the sports festival. That speed and power. She patted her rib guard, face guard and gloves. These things are made of a special alloy and leather that can even stop a high-speed car in its tracks. Well, this is new to me. Haven't sparred like this in. Forever. You ain't in Kansas anymore. You're here with me. Now empty the clip. Peter took a deep exhale, bouncing on his feet. The way Mirko moved that time. She was going so fast he couldn't even see her move. He inhaled and focused. Don't cry if I leave a bruise on ya, Peter declared, and charged. Mirko's ears twitched as she ducked a high jump kick from the brown-haired boy as he landed meters away. Since tingling, Peter raised both arms to block a spinning axe kick from the bronze-skinned woman. He caught it and was sent to the ground, but his legs absorbed the blow as it made the gym quake. He lifted his arms and followed through, aiming a haymaker at her face. Mirko dodged to the side, and Peter's head moved to avoid a jab. He jumped, avoiding a sweeping kick as he lashed out with a strike of his own, only for the rabbit hero to dodge his attack and respond with an uppercut. Peter twirled in mid-air with a punch, yet it was caught by a raised knee, absorbing the blow as Mirko's knee guards caught the fist, and she twirled as Peter's momentum made him lose his balance from the block as he fell. He saw her pivoting again to deliver a kick to the face. Peter's hand lashed out to the ground and pushed up, rising above the kick as he was now head-to-head -head with the white-haired woman who was smiling widely. Peter lashed with a jab, a jab with too much speed and strength that would have caught any other opponent square in the cheek. She was no such thing. Mirko finished her pivot and ducked as she seemed to flip, and she was about to deliver a Pele kick, her kick coming down like a tomahawk. Peter swerved to make himself skinny, using his arm to bat it aside and divert her trajectory as she launched off her feet, only for the kick to never come and Peter's sense tingled. A jab came at his crown as he was unable to defend, and the blow sent him into the ground. Hard, hard enough to make the gym equipment rattle as Peter hit the mat. Oh, oh, oh. Peter groaned, before he felt his sense tingle again and he rolled, avoiding an axe kick as he kicked up to his feet, and Mirko was on him. Now now now, I ain't satisfied with that, Mirko yelled, battle lust flowing through her wild ruby red eyes as she came with a jabbing kick from her strong toned legs. Peter sidestepped and came in with a punch and he increased the speed, faster, only for Mirko to dodge, but he grazed her protective mask which made the woman's eyes widen for a moment in their close tango, drops of sweat in the air as they dodged and exchanged blows. Her grin returned in full force, since flaring up, Peter reacted with a roundhouse kick of his own and the two kicks collided, shin guard to shin guard. Peter grit his teeth, staring with determination at the smirking Mirko. You're getting faster. Holding out on me still, Parker. She mused. Maybe. Peter replied, feeling his heart pump and endorphins flow. Then go faster. She vanished with a kick of her leg against the mat. For Peter the world was a blur as he responded in kind, kicking up the mats as he felt his spider sense tingle in his head as he saw how fast she was. They came close, exchanging jabs and dodging. His edge, his spider sense, hers, experience and speed. He dodged and swerved while keeping a low balance, his sense guiding him in avoiding blows left to right within the seconds of time flowing by. Yet it felt like an eternity for him. He rolled through her strikes, responding in kind, faster than before as he grazed her gear, but couldn't lay in a good hit. The world continued to blur as he twirled and jumped through the air, landing on all fours and charging with a burst of speed from his legs at the woman who was still in mid-pivot. She turned, eyes widened. Peter's sense tingled as he tried to make himself skinny with a sideways twirl, arms raised above his head, and caught a kick to the head that sent him flying to the ceiling. He grunted as he landed back first against the mat covered ceiling. Peter saw stars and the air was knocked out of him as he landed back to the ground in a heap. Oof. He groaned on the ground before feeling a shadow. Rolling on his back, he took in breaths of oxygen at the panting pro heroine as she cast a large shadow over him. Even with that increased, she said, hands on her hips, speed of yours, still can't land a hit. But, Mirko patted her gear, noticeable blemishes seen from his strikes as she smiled, nodding. Not bad. She offered a hand, and Peter grunted, taking it as she helped him up. Thanks. Peter groaned as he stretched out his muscles, shaking his head to regain his composure. Wanna go again? Later. Smell that, Mirko said, finger pointed as Peter took in deep breaths of oxygen. 
He sniffed the air, catching a peculiar aroma. Oh, it's like a teriyaki thingy. And tea. Lunchtime. From the top of the stairs leading into the office, Nakiri was there and holding a tray with rice bowls and a kettle of tea. She walked down the steps as Mirko and Peter sauntered on over. I could hear the office shake around. You two have so much energy. Yeah, Parker's still holding back. I just gotta bring it out of him. Mirko went over and poured herself some green tea from the kettle into a cup and brought it to her lips as the tanuki lady set the food on a table. Peter took the rice bowls and broke up the chopsticks, eating a bit after the small secretary poured him a cup and set it beside him. You're super strong yourself. Fast too. Mirko smirked under the praise. I ain't a top 10 hero for nothing. She jeered as she sipped her cup. Have a juice the stuff. She got her rice bowl, broke up her set of chopsticks, and began to scarf it down, eating at a faster pace than the American boy. So, why did you not hit me? She asked with her mouth full as Peter ate from his bowl. Well, he swallowed some meat as he grabbed a towel off to the side and wiped his face. You're that good. Heh, <laughs> nice summation. But come on, try expanding on it a little. The white-haired woman said as she sipped some tea and leaned back on her bench. Ew, you're too fast and experienced. I've only been fighting seriously like this for the past year or so. Before that it has, well, largely been a breeze and I've never fought anyone as fast as you. Better. You have good speed and power in your strikes, the problem is. She pointed a pair of chopsticks at him as she clenched a piece of stir-fry. You've been fighting crap made out of cardboard for so long that you don't know how to recognize when it's time to cut loose and by the time you realize it you're already half-tired. She swallowed it and chewed as Peter sipped some tea. He blanched a little, but he didn't want to offend her so he kept drinking. It did have a unique herbal taste. Maybe it was an acquired one. I can't just swing for the fences at every random guy on the street. No, but that doesn't mean you can't actually go show in some initiative and find ways to train your speed and strength on your own. The bad guy that can take your punch isn't gonna announce himself in advance for you to get ready to switch gears and get yourself used to fighting at that level again. Use it or lose it, kid. So, I just need to get used to fighting at that speed and strength, huh? Yeah, but speed more than anything. Again, you don't do it so much that when you go at those speeds you're relying on that spider sense bullshit. And yeah it's useful but at your level, at those speeds you're using it like a crutch. She pointed her chopsticks at him again. Be honest, that kick that sent you to the roof, you never even saw it did you? He rubbed his jaw, feeling the phantom pain. No, I didn't. See what I mean? She grinned, too pleased with herself before going back to her bowl. You also lose your creativity when you're going all out. When you're breezing you do all these flips and get creative because you're comfortable, you got time to think. When you're pressed you go back to basics, so your strikes were good, but predictable. Mirko smirked as she grabbed a towel and wiped her face and arms a bit, taking a break from eating as she unclipped her sparring gear. Mix it up, I don't need no spider sense to dodge a telegraph to hell and back right hook. Peter took that advice in, furrowing his brow as he made sense of her words. Now hurry up and finish eating. She picked up her bowl as she got up, walking off and out of the gym. Nekiri was busy picking up the sweaty sparring gear. We gotta do some film, then we shower. Really? Peter mused to himself as he ate. She likes to get things out of the way before she can reward herself with a shower. The tanuki lady said with a smile as she had a big bundle of the special Detenrat model gear in her arms. That's the kind of woman Yuzajiyama Rumi is. She chuckled as she hummed, walking over to the side. Oh and don't be afraid to leave your gear as well, Parker-san. I'll pick them up. Peter looked up as he had half finished his bowl. He set it down and followed the much shorter woman as he began to remove his gear. Don't worry, let me help. Peter took off his boxing mask, arm guards and light gloves before going for his knee guards, setting them down on the table as Nakiri set them all down. Oh thank you. Well, better take your rice bowl up to Mirko-san. She beamed. I'll get to work on sanitizing these. Peter stretched out and rubbed his limbs before he looked down and nodded. Thank you Nakiri-san. You do so many things around here, I hope you get some semblance of a break. He wasn't wrong. Nakiri basically waited hand and foot on Mirko, giving her food and cleaning up after herself in the gym, all while being her secretary and talking to government officials and sponsors. The woman seemed to take it in stride as well. Oh I do. Whenever Mirko-san is out on her country-wide patrols, I tend to use that time to have a break around here and hit the local onsen or bar hop. Nakiri waved her hand. So I'm not being run to the bone. I work hard, and when I get the chance, I play hard. Well, you do you then. Peter rolled his neck as he leapt up the stairs and landed on the wall, sticking to it and jumping back down, all with his bowl in hand and chopsticks in his teeth. He waved, the tanuki woman waving back before she got to work and the American left the gym. 
Urko sat in the mini-theater, lounging back in the screen already on. Peter took his seat, feeling odd doing this while still sweaty. Don't worry, we'll get through this and get our showers. For now, she clicked on the remote, and the clip began to play of Peter's fight against Shizaki. We critique you like a Picasso. Peter watched as the fight played out, him dodging Shizaki's mass array of vines as he fired web bullets in futility. Mirko made a sound. Eh, hey, it's not a bad thing to poke a bit at a distance, although it was kind of a waste after you saw the first few shots not do anything. Save your ammo, but minor nitpickle null. Gotta keep her honest. Peter shrugged. Our quirks aren't the biggest and flashiest, but what we lack in size, we make up for in power and precision when it counts. Now this is a tournament setting, so it's not like you could have gotten a head start. But, give me your assessment on if Shizaki was a villain doing that in say. A boulevard. Around here in Endo. Mirko asked as she paused the clip, looking over to her charge as Peter cupped his chin, thinking. Well, if it's on a street, I would use my webbing and the buildings to my advantage to get to her as fast as he was cut off from the sound of her blowing a raspberry with her tongue out. Peter puffed out his cheeks in annoyance. Slow again. Mirko sighed. Cut out the first part and stick with the second part of your answer there. Gotta stop overthinking this shit. You can run on walls and jump really high. The web is a tool, not the be-all and end-all as you keep relying on it. You swing and takes time to accelerate from a dead stop at ground level. Either rush them before they can sink their teeth into the environment or get somewhere or to something you can use. Don't dance so much around a problem. Tackle it. Well, I can't just blitz jump towards someone like that to stop them if their quirk can dig under concrete and steal. Mirko rolled her head towards him, making Peter confused on why she gave the biggest bitch you serious look. She raised her hand and tapped on the remote as Peter turned to the screen. There was himself, roaring like an enraged beast and charging at Bakugo, his very push off the tile causing the stone to erupt as if a grenade erupted there. And right there in the middle was All Might, stopping him. Peter went perfectly still. You can, dumbass. Different opponent he protested quietly, lips tight. Same principle. She shot back. You wanna know why I rank higher than quirks that can have people turn into dragons or move at hypersonic speeds or can summon cyclones as a fucking washing machine? It's because I don't give people time. Before they even realize what's going down I'm already right on top of them, applying maximum force in the shortest amount of time. It wins a lot of fights and gives you a leg up against a lot of crap that won't go down on the first hit. There's a lot of crap out there and your tactics need to adapt but the biggest thing is like I've been telling you, stop hesitating. It's like you're waiting for someone to give you an order or something. She asked, eyeing Peter hard. It's like you're used to being told what to do, when you have the power to take the initiative and not be some bottom bitch. Peter took a breath, listening, his eyes turned to the still frozen image of Bakugo, All Might and himself. What? Regretting you turning that explodey brat's arm into a twizzler. Mirko drawled. No, it's. Peter trailed off, his tone low. So, I guess hand grenade did get under your skin after all. He was yapping his gums a lot when I watched the fight. Then let me give you a piece of advice. Don't, Marco stated. Peter stared at the floor. Parker, Peter felt his sense flare up and turned, catching the remote she lazily tossed at him, yet the stern glare was on her visage. Villains will do whatever they can to get an edge, and they will do that by talking to mess with your head. She pointed as highlights played of Peter and Bakugo engaging in the tango of blows and dodges being exchanged. The dodging and tanking of explosions, the exploding blonde dodging his blows and kick tile projectiles from the skin of his teeth. I know. Peter looked down at the floor, voice soft, but like steel. Mirko was silent, blinking before looking at the screen. She held out a hand, and Peter handed the remote back to the bronze-skinned woman. The sweat was making him irritated. He wanted a shower. The clip was paused on the barred teethed, wide-eyed, battle-raged Peter being held, his shoulder against All Might's abdomen and clenched fist lashed out towards the prone and shocked Bakugo. Seeing the look now, Peter saw how, damn similar he looked to whenever Bakugo fought. As he thought about it more, Bakugo talked as much as he did. Are we almost done? He asked, in English as he lapsed. He wanted a fucking shower now. Nah. Marco answered back in English before she returned to Japanese. Was thinking is all. Anyway, the way you acted throughout the fight, and how you managed to lay in some blows in that last charge. You could have ended it much sooner, but given how the kid got into your head, you dragged it out. Didn't you? Yeah. Peter nodded, scowling as he looked away. If a villain you could beat in two blows talks and talks, and you drag out the fight to say, two minutes and change just to prove a point. What could happen? Just throw darts. I'm waiting. Mirko crossed her arms, glaring at her charge with red eyes boring into him. 
Peter closed his own as he thought. Maybe he has. Comrades taking part in a heist, or a hostage or... Exactly. Mirko cut him off, glaring at him. We're heroes first and foremost, and while I understand that the sports festival means that you gotta put on a show, if you have the power to end fights as soon as possible, do it. Pro heroes will notice that, even if the public doesn't. You're young and a first year, so I can get you not understanding that. But that level of pettiness to beat up a guy who badmouth you and the recklessness to go in and take unnecessary damage when you could have ended it sooner is fucking retarded. He badmouthed them, not me. Peter lashed out in English, breathing hard as Mirko paused. Realizing his error, he turned and took a deep breath. Sorry. His tone wasn't as steely and cold as before. I won't let it happen again. This, he waved a hand, unable to look at himself in the pause clip. I mean, Mirko was silent, taking an inhale through her nose. Okay then, about time we have a shower. She got up, stretching as Peter did so. Parker, he paused in his walking out of the room, looking back. You have a power that's damn similar to mine, so I'm only telling you what I would do. And it got me to number 7 in the charts. If you wanna go far, put that power of yours to good use. She turned off the TV and walked with him, patting the taller and younger boy on the shoulder. Peter looked at the pro heroine, seeing her ruby red eyes soften lightly as she gave a smirk and a nod, walking past. He followed soon after, happily to bathe under a shower, then relaxing to some tunes with Karen. Shigaraki Tamura stared down at the glass of alcohol in his hands. It was supposed to calm him, to make things feel better, it was what alcohol was supposed to do. He was of age after all. It was also supposed to make you forget things, but that wasn't happening. Every time that Tamura closed his eyes, that stupid fucking smirk from the psycho stain was there. If you're the real deal that is. What the hell did he know? He'd only been in the news for a few weeks at most. The League of Villains literally walked into the greatest hero academy in Japan broke its students and got away, though not without injuries. He reached up, grasping his face. It should be covered. His father should be there, holding him, making it better. His grip on him tightening, to remind him. Yet he wasn't, all because that bitch killed his Naomu, that spider wasn't useful enough to die, and the green fucker who took his father away. They would pay, they would decay from this world inch by fucking inch. Then the rest of the world after. Tamura stopped and looked down. His glass was gone, the drink spilling over the countertop. Tirajiri wordlessly took a rag and wiped away the drink. Then a second later, another drink slid its way into Tamura's waiting grasp. Looked like bourbon again this time. Next time, tequila. The teal-haired youth growled. Of course, Tirajiri obliged. Ah, yes, this was why he hadn't killed them yet. Tamura had to wait. After the nerf that he suffered in the last raid battle, he had to play it safe. Or else the heroes would come. They would act like they would go out to put a stop to him in the name of justice or some shit. But they'd just be going after him because he hurt them, and they thought that he deserved to be punished for it. Self-righteous hypocrites. They'd already hurt him more than he could ever hurt them. Especially All Might. The symbol of peace, making kids capable of taking away his fun. Breaking his horde and ruining their lives all with that fucking smile on his face. He wouldn't be smiling when Shigaraki put his hands around the blonde mistake's throat. Tamura turned, and on the wall, the torn poster of All Might continued to stare back at him. With a flash of movement, he threw his stool to the side and clawed for the edge. He dug his fingers into the brick as he tore the poster from the wall. Pain flared from his now bleeding fingertips, but he didn't grimace from the pain. It tickled. He slumped back in a chair, grabbing his glass as he sauntered by the bar and forced all the burning liquid down his throat. It had a decent aftertaste, but he forced it down, letting his pinky come down and turn the glass to dust for no other reason than he fucking felt like making it dust. In the corner of his eye, Shigaraki knew that Kurajiri was looking at him. Bloodshot eyes snapped to the massive purple and yellow mist. The warp user didn't respond, only turning away and getting ready to make something else for whatever villain that came next. Probably the tequila he commanded. Unlike some other villain that was running around right now. Teacher, he growled out. At the end of the bar, the TV station that was normally just playing static suddenly connected. Only a message of audio only was on screen, but that was all that it took to make Kirajiri shiver where he was. Tamura, to what do I owe the pleasure? Teacher asked in a calm and simple tone. Normally, it was nice to hear that tone. It reminded Shigaraki that he still needed to wait, that there needed to be a plan. Now though, he didn't fucking care. I wanna know. I need to do something, Tamura hissed. Oh, teacher asked, amused, and what would that be? Kirajiri had brought Stain in from that ward, which meant, Hasu, I want it to be on fire. There was a beat of silence from the other end of the monitor. He could hear what he thought was shifting, as teacher no doubt adjusted his position within his healing chair. Hasu, might I ask why you want that city gone? 
aren't there more immediate targets for you to, as you would say, send a raid party to? Yeah, Tamura admitted, but they don't matter. He's not in other cities, he's in Hasu. The teacher asked, and somehow, the question seemed to be directed more towards Kirajiri than Shigaraki, which was fine, he didn't want to talk about that prick anyway. As you suggested, we retrieved the hero killer and offered a place here within the League of Villains. And judging from Tamura's reaction the meeting went in. Unforeseen directions. I wasn't ever going to work with him, Tamura growled darkly. The preaky prick. I never said that I thought you were wrong to turn him away, teacher said. Again, his tone calm and smooth. In fact, I'm impressed that you were able to gleam your compatibility within so little time. Recognizing who is worth bringing into the fold and who is worth ignoring is a skill that will serve you well. The young man felt his heart tickle a bit with pride and praise, but the drunken rage still took over. Why the fuck would I ignore them? Tamura asked as he got off the chair and leaned against the bar. If I turn them to dust for pissing me off, then there's no problem. Ah, oh, I believe I see the connection here. Teacher was smiling no doubt, putting it together. You want to destroy Stain for his slight against you. It's not just a slight. Tamura roared, his fist slamming into the bar counter. He stood there, he looked down on me and questioned if I was the real deal. Me. There's no one else in this fucking world more ready to bring chaos and devastation to every fucking part of this broken society yet he thinks that just because he's got some fancy title, some knives, and killed some low-ranking randos that he can judge if I'm the real deal or not. He ranted, red eyes boring into the TV. He's insulting me, he's insulting you. He's insulting every one of us that know exactly what we're going to do to rip this world up from the roots. The teal-haired youth stopped, panting as he struggled to fill his lungs with air once more. Kirajiri didn't move. Teacher said nothing, which was fan-fucking-tastic. Burning down Hasu will be a start, a message that no matter who you are, what you do for a living or whatever the world fucking calls you, you're still just here because the League of Villains hasn't noticed you yet. There's no team that you can hide behind, no symbol of peace that can run to save you when we come after you. There's just what you did, and the fucking consequences to follow. He held a hand out, and I wanna destroy. I wanna smell char, blood, burnt meat, hear those pathetic normies of society scream in terror and despair as they die on the curbside. And this society will never be able to sleep in their beds. He grinned widely, too wide as his red eyes bulged where his hand mask should have been. Calmly and safely, even with the symbol of peace still roving about, he leered into the TV, salivating. They will know that we are here. Teacher remained quiet behind the monitor as Tamura panted, glaring at the screen. You wish for Naomu, yes? He asked. Yeah, an army of M. The youth licked his lips. What better way to show him fear than showing that we have more than one Naomu? You'll get your Naomu Tamura, but not an army. Tamura froze, ready to object before teacher continued. I will give you 15, and only 3 on a more advanced level. As strong as the one made to kill All Might. Tamura leaned forward in anticipation. Not as advanced, but better than most of the rabble. At this stage, you want to make a statement, not a manifesto. Teacher said from his end of the feed. I trust you'll know what to target then. Yeah. Tamura narrowed his eyes. I got an idea. I'll be looking on down from the balcony seats. As much as a splash zone would be fun to sit in. He scratched his neck, remembering UA and the phantom pain in his teeth, upper lip and nose. I remember the last time that happened. Good, I will get them ready. Teacher replied, his tone evident from a pleased smirk. Kirajiri, ready mid and 7, 10, and 22. Take 12 of the common noun with you as well to back them up. As you wish sir. Kirajiri had a hand over his chest, bowing lightly in compliance. Shigaraki, the man turned to his accomplice and saw the black mist villain expand and consume him. Before long, the warm ambience of the bar was gone and in its place was the warm humid May evening air. Tamura looked around, observing the skyline of Tokyo, and before him the mass expanse of a certain ward. They were on top of a building, specifically on a large water tower. This is Hasu, huh? He asked, arms crossed. Looks too damn clean. His red eyes turned towards a collection of taller buildings and bundled lights. Yes, that will do. And too, lively. He could hear the light sound of Kirajiri's warp expanding as Tamura stood atop the tower. He scratched his neck as the wheels in his head spun. Stain. He was too high and mighty. Who the fuck does he think he is? I actually attacked an installation, an institution wrought with those hero maggots, and all he does is pick off small fry. He ranted to himself. He's done more damage in the short term, however, you can make an argument Shigaraki. That Stain is benefiting heroes. Tamura growled from Kirajiri's comment. That's so, yes, all across Honshu, specifically here in the Tokyo wards, the areas he has appeared in have seen crime drop across the board. 
Some theorize that it's tied to an increase in hero awareness, as if he is a wake-up call for them to be better. Tamura turned, his red eyes glaring into his black mist handler. I am only speaking as the devil's advocate, and besides, if Stain is gone, then the heroes can be lax. And what better way to flush out an annoying wasp from the hive? Tamura crossed his arms, than to set the entire tree ablaze. He's more like a hero breeder, the fucking hypocrite. He sighed, hearing the growls and groans behind him. If Stain wants to kill those pathetic heroes, let him. He raised his hand, eyes fixed onto the distract a mile away. That area, he said, unturning towards his biomechanical monsters. Go there, and when you do, destroy anything and everything. Kill everyone. And he stood tall, feeling three massive shadows loom behind him as Tamura let out a smirk, seeing them take off with mighty leaps, and a pattering of footsteps as the man-sized low ends followed with their gangly arms and legs. I'll let you fall with the very heroes you're aiming to purify. Die under my Naomu, or be arrested, locked away to await a firing squad. Take how you choose to die, hero killer. That'll be the only benefit of me, the real deal, meeting you. As expected of his father's hero agency, the number of options available for dinner was far more than any reasonable person would need. Shoto just picked up a bento box and sat down in the enormous cafeteria. It wasn't as big as the one within his father's normal facility, but even the short notice of his father's agency arriving was little more than a slight panic attack to the Hasu branch office of the Endeavor Agency. Most of the work here was in accordance with training him and the other sidekicks, according to his father. And surprisingly, only one of the sidekicks decided to sit with him. Burnins had more energy than his sister, which was a welcome development. It distracted from the fact that he was actually doing this internship. As uncomfortable as it was in some situations, Shoto couldn't say that the situation didn't have its upsides. The amount of field experience that he was getting was frankly staggering. His father's reputation of having the most victories of any other hero was well earned. The number of patrols that he took with his psychics put all others to shame. Shoto had only been on half of them, the other half he was in the training room getting a hand on his left side. The choice had barely been his. After he showed off his fire in the festival, and after using it during some of the field assignments, Shoto's father had put him on mandatory training so that he didn't overuse it. It would be heartwarming if Shoto didn't know that his father did it mostly so Shoto wouldn't have any apprehensions of using it in the field. It was Burnin's that was assigned as his mentor for the training sessions. Her own fire quirk wasn't as destructive as his own, but her control was amazing. The golden fire-haired girl's advice had been quite the boon. Also her loud personality made it so that she was the only one that really talked to him during his lunch and dinner breaks. Even now she sat across from him, munching on the meal of the day while talking about something or other. She did most of the talking really, Shoto answered with simple and quick answers. He didn't know about the current subject as he had lost track of what she was talking about ten minutes ago. Something about advice, apparently she had a lot to say about it if she hadn't stopped talking. So if she's still talking to you, she's interested, get what I'm saying. Shoto looked up from his box. Should he not hear? Probably, so he did. A good choice as Burnins looked rather pleased with herself after the answer. Poking the last of his food, Shoto glanced around at the other heroes. Some of them glanced back, some waved, but most seemed to be focused on one thing or another. But enough of that, you on for the away? Burnins asked. Shoto nodded. Father says that we're almost finished being in Hasu. Yeah, don't ask me why though, the big man has kept that little tidbit to himself. The blonde heroine glanced around before leaning in slightly. Rumor is though, that he's trying to go after the hero killer. Hero killer. That name struck a chord with Shoto. In the back of his mind, he remembered hearing something about Ada's brother being attacked by the killer. He'd managed to escape with his life, a luxury that many other heroes targeted by the hero killer didn't seem to share. Hence why the villain had gotten this title. How does my fa he stopped himself? and took a deep breath, Endeavor, no the hero killer is in Hasu. No clue, Bernie's admitted, maybe a tip. Maybe he noticed a pattern. Lot of people see boss man as a big brute, but he's got a pretty good head on his shoulders. Shoto declined to comment. However he did it, he's shooting for the big prey. Hero killer's been getting some press lately, so it's only a matter of time before some hero takes him out. What makes you think it would be that simple? Shoto asked. Bernie's shrugged, the golden fire-haired woman looking off to the side. Just a feeling. He's been hitting some of the smaller heroes, but he's been avoiding some of the bigger fish. Chances are pretty good that he's got something up his sleeve if he's managed to get this far. But the second he bites off more than he can chew, a wide dangerous grin appeared on her visage. A top 10 is going to come down on him like, well, your dad. Shoto nodded, made sense he supposed. 
throwing his chopsticks in the bento box, Shoto rose from his seat, only to freeze as an unholy alarm blared from all around. He froze, and Bernan's smile dropped off her face. From the exit of the station, his father blasted into the room. Emergency level 1. All hands on deck. We're at war here people. War. You heard the man, kid. Bernan's shouted, dragging Shoto with her as she and the other heroes rushed to the exit, his father leading the charge. It took a few steps, but Shoto fell into place with the rest of them. His body moved on its own, conditioned to follow and react. Even still his mind asked the burning question. What the hell was attacking? One minute she was doing meditation, the next sirens blared out and she was in her hero costume, getting into a helicopter. The actions were automatic, a testament to her training. Right across from her was Yoroi Musha. She clipped the seatbelts across her chest and put on the helmet with the mic attached. Good reaction time, Musha said as the chopper began to take off. She turned, seeing the other psychics, big and small pile into the helicopters and some vehicles within the hangar. What's going on? She asked as the chopper began to fly, and the castle that served as Musha's agency was before them. The hangar positioned right behind the massive structure in the concrete jungle of Corasanto. We have reports of villains attacking the district next door, Endeavor's agency is holding on with the local ones. But these aren't ordinary villains, said one of the psychics in her ear. Judging by the voice, it had to be Jinjiro. She turned, seeing the monk robe-clad hero get onto a helicopter. Yes, even when burnt and scarred they refused to yield. These villains, going by the look of them, may not even be human, said the armored samurai hero as he inspected a tablet before handing it to Momo, the girl taking it as she saw the buildings passing by. As she looked at the still camera feeds, her eyes widened. How so? Jinjiro asked on the other end. Momo felt her blood turn to ice as Musha and his psychic's conversation faded in the background. A hulking black titan with no eyes and a pronounced lower jaw was lifting a bus over its head. A thin gangly green-skinned creature with an open shrieking mouth as it held a pro hero by the neck, leaning in to bite as it kept the hero down with its long arms. In the background of the sky, a creature with wings and a gas mask burnt into its face. Another camera shot had another hulking man, with a mask covering most of its head, biting on some harness or bit attached to the helmet had multiple arms with the hands replaced by chainsaws or drills. All of their brains were exposed, and if their eyes were seen, they were bulging, bloodshot. Just like the Naomu from the USJ, the one made by the League of Villains to kill All Might, the one that would have torn them apart if they were any slower, the one she killed to save Parker. That look on your face, Momo gasped, looking up, seeing Musha stare directly at her, through her, familiar in some way. Momo bit her lip, recalling those memories, how she couldn't sleep a wink after that. She took a deep breath. Yes, Musha-san, remember the USJ, and how there was a villain who was sent to kill All Might. I do. Are you saying there's a connection? There is, I think. Momo elaborated. The League of Villains called the villain there a Naomu, and said that it was made to kill All Might. Made? Yes, as if the monster was created in a lab, like a Frankenstein's monster, if I would put it lightly. Momo held her arm, looking out to the skyline of Corasanto. As she looked up, she could see a trail of smoke. So, the group of villains attacking Hasu's downtown are very similar to the monsters created by the League of Villains. They only obey commands from one man. She remembered him, the youth in black covered in hands, the leader of the League, Shigaraki Tamura. Musha finished, eyes narrowed, then defending the civilians against these creatures or finding Shigaraki are the priority. Priyadi, the teen perked up. You will run support and aid in any way with evacuations. The chopper was beginning to descend as Momo's blood ran cold at the sound of screams, but she steeled her resolve. We will do our best to apprehend and defeat them. She was working with heroes, time to act like one. Understood. The trail of smoke caused by the evening winds was visible as Momo looked out through the mirrors to the side, seeing a section of Hasu Ward on fire, with several giant glaciers in between. Todoroki, she mused to herself before movement caught her eye, seeing Musha place a hand on his helmet. I see. He unbuckled his straps. Creati, come, change of plans, he asked as the hulking samurai stood up. Wait, why were they leaving the helicopter now, sir? She asked as she unbuckled her harness, walking over to the taller man as he patted his armor. His chest flowed, then transformed into a parachute backpack, designed for two people as Momo got the clue. Again, she had skydived before as a child as she went up to him, sliding her arms through the straps and tightening up. A distress call came in from a concerned citizen near our vicinity. We're the closest ones. We will intercept before aiding Endeavor and the local Hasu hero firms. Musha elaborated. His eyes looked to the side as he kept his hand to his ear. Jinjiro, I have something to attend to. 
possible villain attack with a pro hero in danger. You coordinate with Endeavor when you arrive at the fire zone. Understood. I will join you when the matter is settled. The helicopters seem to rise up into the sky to give them room to plummet and activate his chute. Roger. Came a loud confirmation from the other end of the comm. A mile or so down the road was a cacophony of destruction, screams, and quirks being fired about. Downtown Hasu. Let's go. Musha leapt out of the chopper, Momo with him, strapped to his transmuted custom parachute. His chute activated and they sailed towards the ground. Arg. Tenya yelled as he charged. He'd found him. He'd actually found him. Tenya saw nothing but red as the armored intern charged the bandaged killer with a downwards axe kick. The hero killer dodged back, moving at an accelerated speed that Tenya couldn't fathom. Tenya hissed, eyes narrowed to slits, only to get a bladed kick to the shoulder, puncturing his armor and making him wince as he was sent flying right into a dumpster. The bin caved in, Tenya dazed and falling onto all fours as he tried to shake the stars out of his vision. Then the shadow of a sword came down. Tenya had the wherewithal to roll and avoid the slash that would have lopped his head off. He crawled back, glaring hard at the killer. What are you doing here, kid? The hero killer oiled. A city's burning, and you come for me. Shut up. Tenya roared, tunneling in on this. Monster in human skin as his thruster charged. He'd end this. In one fell swoop. Shoulder tackle him into the wall, or kick him and make him a stain on the brickwork. He might dislocate his shoulder or strain his legs. But that was a price worth paying. Recipro. Just like against Parker, only this time, no web shooters. End it. Now, burst. The world was a blur as Tenya's quirk. Engine. Picked up into high gear as blue afterburner flames roared out as he charged. Murder on his mind. Yet the bandaged man pivoted, avoiding Tenya's strike as if he knew it was coming. The next thing Tenya knew was agony across his legs as the hero killer's sword came down, slashing through his back leg armor and into his hamstrings. Growl. <laughs> He yelled as he fell like a puppet whose strings had been cut, skidding across the alleyway and landing against the wall, hard against his shoulder. Through the white-hot agony, Tenya felt something pop in his shoulder as his vision blurred. He did his best to move, barely. You and your brother are the same, nothing but weak frauds. The hero killer hissed as he sneered down at the seething and squirming youth. Shut up, you monster, Tenya yelled, mustering up the power to look up at the approaching man, his blue eyes alight with a fury he never knew he'd possessed. He's crippled for life because of you. He'll never be a hero again. He's saved. Countless people. He breathed hard, trying to crawl towards the bladed murderer. He was an amazing leader, and an even better hero. He thought back to all those times he and Tensei would talk whenever Tensei got off work, eating with the family. He would look so strong and capable, as if he was invincible, always having a smile on his face, yet always so humble and willing to give credit to others, yet always needing to work harder. And to see him maimed like that, Crippled, he was the ideal hero, my hero, my inspiration, and you ruined him, you son of a bitch, I'll kill you, then if he is your ideal, follow through on it. The hero killer hissed as he paused, his red eyes almost looking like they're glowing in the darkness of the alleyway. Then he pointed to the bleeding native who was slumped against the wall, yet was looking at Tenya and his assailant with widened eyes. Save him first, did that thought ever cross your mind? Or were you too obsessed with your own lust for vengeance? Tenya breathed hard, the storm raging in his head. Real heroes save those in need. They forsake themselves, using their god-given powers for the sake of others. And yet here you are. He looked down on Tenya as if looking at a cockroach before he lifted up his blade to his mouth, ranting and raving like some mad dog chasing cars, while people are in need of saving. You truly are, he said as he licked the blade. A pathetic fake hero, and Tenya felt his entire body clench up, freezing on the spot as he found it hard to breathe. He couldn't move. Was, was this it? His quirk. Although, before I forget, I should purge of that fraud too. The hero killer muttered as he turned around, walking away from the surprised youth. The pro-hero native further down the alley froze up, eyes wide. The blue-haired boy's heart froze. Wait, hang on, stop. Tenya urged as he tried to move, but couldn't. The angle he was lying at had him look at the hero killer's back as he approached the pro. I'll leave him alone. I sought you out. The hero killer paused, looking back with judging eyes. Don't kill him. The murderer scoffed. You should have saved him when you had the chance. The pro hero had his eyes on Tenya as the hero killer progressed onward. H hey, kid. The pro hero called out, Tenya feeling his blood turn to ice as native looked terrified at first. Before he smiled lightly. I it's gonna be okay. Alright. No. Kill me. Leave him be. Tenya roared at the top of his lungs as the hero killer approached. He grabbed the adult by his hair. His feather that was around his headband coming off and fluttering to the ground. 
Please, stop it. The black-haired man brought his katana to his neck. I, Stain, shall excise you. May your death bring about a pure and more righteous world. What came next was the sound of serrated steel piercing flesh and blood bursting out of the pro hero's throat as it was cut. Tenya screamed, tears flowing as he felt guilt crushing him like a car press. The pro fell to the ground, a crimson pool growing as Stain tossed his body aside. Stain glared hard as he walked towards the wailing and weeping Tenya. Save your breath. He sneered as Tenya looked up at him, the blood-red moon overhead as he saw the red-eyed killer gazing down. You'll be joining him soon enough. Go to hell, you fucking demon. Tenya hissed, eyes burning with hate and sorrow, wishing he was able to move again. Stain scoffed as he approached, blade raised high to bring down. You first, I, Stain, shall excise you. May your death bring about a pure and more righteous war gah. His ritualistic one-liner was cut off as the hero killer staggered, turning about as Tenya saw a form tackle into him. It was some, Van, too pale or green skin to be normal, with long arms and too tight jeans, barefoot too. He was groaning as he charged Stain once more. Stain hissed, avoiding a charge from the long-armed man and slicing its arm. There was no cry, only more groaning as they turned about and Tenya's mouth went agog. Four eyes embedded within an exposed brain. The man, creature thing was tight with muscle. He looks like the villain, from the USJ. Tenya said to himself as the creature let out a surprised squawk, landing on its face. Stain came upon it, and brought his katana to the creature's brain, and rammed it through with a grunt. The groaning Namu lookalike's bloodshot eyes widened, then rolled as it ceased to shake and jerk. Dead? Now then, Stain breathed, turning around. Where was I? He shouldered his katana, glaring at Tenya as he approached him, and the blue-haired youth felt his heart plummet. Move damn it. Move. There was the sound of armor, and Tenya saw a shadow move fast from the other end of the alleyway. Stain twirled in an about face, red eyes wide with anger and surprise as he brought his sword to bear down. And his blade clashed, sparks flying as it met the katana of a broad and armored samurai, his dark and white eyes shining in the darkness. Yoroi Musha. Tenya gasped, in utter shock. The boy was injured, bleeding from his legs, but breathing, which was a miracle in and of itself. Yoroi Musha kept himself between the man that could be no one else other than the hero killer and his target. Minimal armor, lithe but toned frame, built for speed in close quarters combat. His stance was low, hands gliding over the hilt of his serrated blade, his eyes flickering over Musha's stance, his hands on his own sword. The hero killer gripped his blade, and Musha charged. He rushed forward, thrusting his own katana forward, gauging his opponent's stance. The villain dipped down, dodging the blade's clean edge by a hair's breadth. One hand left his katana, and brought out a hunting knife to cut clean through the pro-hero's hands. Musha retreated, and the blade met the knife. Years of training and reflexes made the top 10 pro's stance return, and just in time for the fast and wild slash from the hero killer. His sword met Musha's own, and his knife was caught within Musha's arm guards. Creati, get the fallen to safety, Musha ordered, pushing the killer back. Right, came her voice. The second he felt Musha start to press him, he broke the blade lock, and his blade sang as it arced through the air towards Musha's neck. Musha batted it aside with his armored gauntlet and came in, sparks flying as two blades clashed. Dark white eyes bored into rageful blood-red orbs. Musha went for the shoulder, hands, even the ankles as he pushed the hero killer back, blade in front as he went for thrusts, slashes, and overhead strikes. In retaliation, his opponent aimed for his eyes, his neck, the folds in his armor close to major arteries, even his fingers, anything to land a blow. After another clash, the hero killer rushed forward with an animalistic growl, bringing his katana down in an overhead slash as he sounded more like a demon than a man. Musha dipped to the side, letting the villain's strength and gravity take his blade straight into the ground. Yet he watched as the hero killer steadied himself on the ground and from his handstand kicked Musha's sword hand, only for the bladed sole of his foot to meet the hero's arm guard. Though, that seemed to be the point. Twisting in a way that no man should not be able to move, the hero killer pivoted from his handstand, his katana's blade going straight for his now exposed footing, grinning demonically only for his eyes to go wide as another Kanabo appeared in Musha's offhand where there wasn't one a heartbeat before. His momentum halted. Musha gave the villain a much-needed kick to the shoulder as hard as he could. Musha heard something crack from the force of it, and the villain landed across the ground, skidding like a stone on a pond and dropping his serrated sword. Yet, even as Musha willed his armor to give birth to another blade, he was already on his feet. His shoulder was dislocated, yet the beast of a man didn't seem to mind. In fact, he grinned like a madman, his eyes white with battle lust as he pressed his hand against it. 
He grunted, and Musha heard the limb snap back into place. His pain tolerance was certainly high if nothing else. Stain closed the distance with a roar, and he swung his sword hard with a spinning slash as he jumped. On instinct Musha brought one blade up to block, the sparks flying out as they clashed. The light of the sparks shone on something below him. His bladed boots. Musha leaned back as far as he could, an action that saved his eye as the killer kicked with his hidden weapon, nicking his helmet. Momo prayed as she got to Ida, managing to find a side alley and sprint around as fast as she could to the whimpering teen. Ida Sam, hang on, she said as she bent down to him, hefting him up by his shoulders as she grunted. He was heavy with the armor and by his own muscular frame, but she could deal with that as she heard and saw the clangs of steel and sparks fly in the alleyway. Tenya was shivering, shaking as he had his hands clenched. I let him die. I let him die. He uttered, tears in his eyes as he breathed hard. Momo pulled a bit of her skin-tight skimpy uniform aside, her stomach alight as she made a gurney on the go. Calm down. It's gonna be okay. Momo saw the look of guilt in his face as the tears flowed. She walked away from the alley, hearing the clash of swords behind her. With a plop, the gurney was conjured and she set him down on it, guiding him out of the alley. The boy grunted as he winced. She knew that she had to treat his injuries, but for now, the farther she got him away from the hero killer, the better. She began to push, hearing the boy seethe and breathe before her, going into a controlled run. Her back was glowing, and she felt her uniform beginning to tear. She'd just form another bra later. Modesty was not a virtue to uphold right now as a blanket was formed. They got to a street and she stopped, setting the newly formed blanket on the ground as glowing lights flowed from her thigh while she helped Ida to the ground. I'm going to set you onto your stomach, Ida Sam, she said, getting him into position as he winced and cried. I failed. I failed. Brother, native son, I'm sorry. He whimpered as Momo treated the cuts to his thighs. She conjured rags from her legs and began to clean around the area, first removing some of his leg armor. She didn't know how to stitch a wound. How could she close the cuts? She reached down, grabbing the flare gun being formed on her stomach and lifted it up, firing into the air. That should get someone's attention. In the meantime, she held a hand to her stomach as her free hand kept putting pressure on the wound and cleaning it. Momo's brain was in overdrive as she looked at her crying friend. She made some bandages and got to work on wrapping them around his leg. And to help, she conjured two belts and got to work as Ida repeated the same apologies. Musha charged, fainting an overhead strike with one sword while attacking the villain's rear guard with the other. One blade was deflected, the other, now glowing, met home and smashed against his side, the katana transforming into a kanabo club. The villain didn't stagger, he simply moved with the blow, jumping to the side and leaping off the wall to gain the overhead advantage. Blades screamed as the Kenabo and Katana halted the villain's own in a flurry of sparks. He pushed against Musha with all the force that his body weight and gravity could allow, but Musha's guard would not break. He remembered the old days of heroism, the days when All Might couldn't be counted on to arrive and solve the crisis at hand. Villains back then thought that just because of their considerable strength they could simply smash through anything that could come between them and whatever victory they were trying to achieve. Some could be brought to bear to stop them head on, yet Musha hadn't tried that in years. Were he a younger hero, he might have tried such a tactic, if only to respect his opponent by playing by their rules. Now however, there were people to defend, to save, villains to punish before him. Someone like this, a villain that kills heroes wasn't worth respecting only defeating. So Musha angled his swords downwards, letting the hero killer slide by him. And as gravity brought him to the ground, Musha swung his fist, and brass knuckles formed from his remaining gauntlet met the jaw of a filthy villain, blood spurting from his lip. For the second time tonight, he rolled across the floor of the alleyway as he yelled and coughed. In the instant that he hit, Musha allowed himself a single moment of reprieve to exhale. He was getting old. Even with his suit and training, the hero killer was an animal. Then the moment was over, and Musha had to bring his weapons together to avoid another strike from a blood-curdling war cry, only to barely avoid the strike of a knife that was aimed for his eye. It scraped against the side of his helm, cutting into his visor but holding strong. Musha's head snapped forward, his metal helm crashing into the soft cartilage of the villain's nose. He saw the hero killer's eyes roll back, blood spurting from where his nose would be in his mouth as the villain staggered back, the knife left in the hero's visor. One foot slammed into the ground to steady himself, but it gave Musha just enough space to slam his kanabo against his opponent's stomach. The sword clattered to the ground as the serial murderer grunted and coughed, now sent flying and crashing into the wall, his blade close by. The hero killer reached out only to see a particular ball of white substance fly over the hero's shoulder. It hit the blade, instantly rolling over the metal to cover every inch of it with its mass-like. 
spider webs. The villain was just as surprised as Musha himself. He gave the barest of glances behind him and saw Creative with what looked to be a specially made launcher, looking like a smaller baseball launcher combined with one of those hot dog launchers they had at sporting events. Whatever it was, the substance was useful. As far as the hero could see, the villain was completely disarmed. His trademark katana was trapped. His breathing was ragged, indicating bruised ribs, and fighting with a previously dislocated shoulder would only add to a greater toll in stamina. Musha watched as the killer's eyes narrowed, a new thought passing through that maddened mind. What once was filled only with the desire for the hunt and kill was replaced with an understanding. He looked between the hero, his intern, and the fact that there were no hostages present. Gears turned, and the hero killer made his choice in an instant. He turned and ran, and Musha was right behind him. The killer ducked into another alleyway, and Musha turned the corner, crossguard ready for a counterattack. It didn't come as Musha watched the killer climb up a fire escape. Musha brought his weapons to his hands, forming them back to his gauntlets. He then touched his hip plate armor, and from it a grapple gun was formed. He aimed upwards and fired, reeling himself up after the fleeing man. He arrived at the edge slower than he would have liked but it gave him just enough time to see the hero killer jump the gap of this building to the next only to deliver a smoke bomb as Musha changed his grappling hook into a crossbow to aim. He could be going anywhere, the smoke bomb covering the entire rooftop before the top 10 pro could fire a bolt. He was gone, yet Musha's team had injured him, and the Naumus still hadn't been dealt with if he recalled. It took maybe a second for Musha to come to a decision. This is your eye, Musha, he called into his communicator as he surveyed the area, eyeing the glowing red war zone of downtown Hasu with its raised glaciers and billowing dark smoke. All heroes, be advised, the hero killer is within Hasu fleeing via rooftop, about a thousand meters away from downtown. Where? Where is he Musha? The gruff voice of Endeavor demanded. He was here hunting for him, it seemed. He's advancing towards the residential area of Hasu to the west, near the Teikodena ward. Be advised, suspect is injured, bruised ribs most likely, relocated arm, broken nose. Is the Naumu situation handled? We're wrapping them up now, troublesome bastards those monsters are. Acknowledged, Endeavor said, then the connection cut off. Musha could see a red-hot meteor take off from downtown, jumping over buildings. As he put his hand down, Musha almost pitied the hero killer. The second that Endeavor found him, he would have an even worse time than when he fought Musha. Todoroki NG was as good of a close-range fighter as he was anything else. He wasn't the number two hero in Japan for nothing. Reaching up, Musha ripped the combat knife out of his visor. He conjured a grapple gun from his hip armor, lowering himself down to the alleyway as he inspected the knife. Military issue, but outdated by at least a decade. JDSF model. Interesting. Yoroi Musha-san. He turned, and glanced down to see Creative tending to the armored youth. Paramedics were close by, and as Musha touched the ground, he saw a hero in blue with a fish-like theme run past, calling Ida's name. That was young Manuel Wasanit. Ida, wait, the armor. He recognized it. Was that Ingenium's brother? Ah, uh, now the situation was becoming clear. How are the wounded? He asked. A paramedic team is treating Ida Sam. I did my best to help stop the bleeding and they are tending to him now. Creati replied, face hard. I'm afraid native Sam. Musha sighed in relief, thanking the gods once again for small miracles. The two of them turned the corner, and the hero got a good look at the fallen hero and the student having their wounds being tended to by the paramedics just as Creati had said. Beside him, said in turn was watching them tend to the student, worry as clear as day in her eyes. He saw Manuel talking to Ida, the student still weeping and wincing as the paramedics tended his back, removing this armor. Creati, he said, breaking the girl from her thoughts. He placed a hand on her shoulder. You did well. He meant it, tending to someone who had been injured and holding out as long as possible, managing to prevent a skilled and incredible killer from getting his katana, and following through with a clear head. You called him Ida. If I recall, you two are in the same class. Class 1 a yes. Yes, we are. He'll need a familiar face. His dark eyes softened. Give him support until the paramedics take him to the hospital. Then, we tend to the people. The girl nodded, and by her expression, thankful for the chance to help her fellow young hero. She left, and Musha looked to the still-burning city. Though the fires still raged, the sounds of battle had diminished. Perhaps, mercifully, it was over for the people. Are you fucking kidding me? Those two, Grah shit. Tamura cursed as he stowed his binoculars away as he settled down on the water tower, watching the carnage from miles away at downtown, 
and then down a certain boulevard where that speed guy and that skimpy clad slut were at with paramedics. I wanna kill him. I would advise it against it. What with Yorai Musha being present, along with the approaching pro heroes. Kurajiri advised as he stood behind his charge. The teal-haired youth looked behind him, giving the black mist man a glare as he scratched his neck. And going by those fucking glaciers, Endeavor's brat has survived too. Got him nit. His scratching became more erratic. The one who warned All Might didn't die fast enough. Then that fucking whore arrived with a top 10 pro. And Stain got away. G-R-R-R-R-G-H. Nothing goes my way. He hissed, irritated before he sighed. On the bright side, Tamira drawled. Pausing as he turned, I crinkled in amusement at the fires and smoke from downtown. All those Namu I sent surely resulted in casualties. And Stain is gonna get flushed out for sure. I know it. The death count should be on tonight's news or tomorrow. And with Stain taking to the rooftops and that fireball hopping around and away from us, I can assume that Endeavor is in hot pursuit. We should leave, Shigaraki Tamura. Yeah yeah yeah. Tamura shrugged before looking at the billowing tower of smoke going into the sky. As much as he'd love to kill those three, that wasn't possible with all those people around. Outgunned and manned in every sense of the word. Besides, he did what he came to Hasu to do. Now, everyone will know that the League of Villains is alive and well. He looked down at his hand. We ain't no flash in the pan. We're. He could see Kirajiri expand himself in his peripheral vision. The real deal. He clenched his fist, and Tamura turned around, towards the black abyss that was his handler's portal, hands now in his pockets. Potential party members would come for sure. They now knew that Tamura had the numbers with the Naomu which teacher could create. That the League, destined to change and append this hero society, would not go quietly into the night. Not be taken down by some rando kids. Yes, those brats would die for sure. He hadn't forgotten. They'd be the first to fall. Then, he will destroy this world. Tamura had a face-splitting grin, one befitting of a demon on his chapped and scarred features, his blood-red eyes almost glowing in the darkness. He'd made his statement. Next time, he would send a message. It'll never be all right, normies, he said, turning to the burning city. Victory in his eyes as Tamura had the devil's smile. Because I am here. Heta. <laughs> and with a flash, the League of Villains left Hasu, blood and bodies left in their wake, and Shigaraki Tamura's fading laughter. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 14. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.